these tournaments um you have to qualify for and there's a very small number of people qualified but i feel like it has the scg players champs mm-hmm. feel to it if that makes sense to you it, it does uh, how am i sounding by the way quickly great we... it's okay. absolutely great i don't you know uh chat does does dom sound great do i look great as well just uh shower me with praise please you're all you, you always look great in my heart dom <laughs> I, actually, you looked less great when you were wearing the Neruda headband. Well, that, that's just an outright lie, Jarvis. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. So here's where the story begins. It's, it's January 2021. It's a new season of qualifiers for this event, you know? Um, for those of you who don't play MTGO, basically every month an event is run. If you make top eight of the event, then you get invited to the qualifier that I played in last week. Uh, I made top eight of the January one. Actually, I lost the finals to Death and Taxes. I was allowed to play with Dread Horde Arcanus, so I took full advantage of that. Um, and then, so I just recorded everyone who made it top eight because I think just doing the research matters. You know, th- this first top eight, I think it's a really good top eight. Like, you have Aaron Rolantless, European Crusher. Um, X-Whale plays a lot. Kogamo, one of the all-time greats. I'm I'm sure you have plenty of nice things to say about him. Yeah, Kenji Samora, uh, someone who, you know, uh, one of the absolute best players on the Pro Tour a good 15, 20 years ago, and still now one of the best players on uh, Magic Online. Yeah, uh, I kind of think he did not play a lot with his deck before this tournament, but he made top eight, because I think those decks are horrible, and I think if he had played enough, he would have been like, this deck is bad. Uh, but... <laughs> Can you share the screen with me quickly so I oh, can? Oh, uh, you're right. I I did not do that real quick. Enjoy this beautiful spreadsheet. Yeah, I have a lot of spreadsheets made for this tournament because kind of think. Okay, call me crazy. I don't see a lot of value in spamming leagues when the people you play against are not the people in this tournament. If that makes sense. Right. It's a. Uh... I think it can be good if, let's say, you're testing a new deck or maybe oh, some sure. new new card or something, and you want a vague sense of how it feels. Um, but yeah, if you expect most of the tournament to be on, you know, Delver or Death and Taxes or just uh, these specific decks that they showed up with, then getting paired against, uh, I don't know, Slivers or Reanimator or something in a league, like what is that actually going to teach you? Well, unless it's literally the person that's in the tournament as well, actual nothing. Yes. And actually, I had a, there were a few leaks that I heard about, and then I was bamboozled because the person wasn't actually playing the deck that they leaked in the league. So it's kind of a funny, weird information war as well. Um, but, you know, that happened. So, you know, this was the January one. Aaron, you know, Death and Taxes. I looked at their other decks, Death and Taxes Elves. Baku91 played Poke Pile with, you know, the Stifle Uro deck that had yeah. Afterwave. They also played Grixis Stifle Delver, so I just thought they were probably going to play some, like, either Blue Red Rug or Grixis, like, Delvery sort of thing. x played Arcanist, you know, Teamer, so I thought there was a good chance. They also played Elves a little bit, so, you know, but they, they were technically in the Discord I was in as well, so I didn't, like, I don't know how to put it. When you work with people, you kind of just ignore them. And just keep it in the back of your mind, but you don't write in the spreadsheet. I didn't like write myself down. I didn't write down for BMJ or Bill, although I guess it was already there. I didn't write down the predicted decks, rather. Yeah, that's how it mostly worked when when I had a job. I, I just ignored my coworkers and didn't write in any spreadsheets. Hmm. Well, Dom, that's not a great way to keep a job, I think, most of the time. Uh, anyway, uh, so a bunch of uh, very smart uh, Rug Devil players, yeah. and then ra- rounding out the the January results, we have the eventual champion uh, Patchy Sanchez on uh, uh, boobs. Are they, yeah. I I actually I kind of think they did not play a lot of Legacy before that, and they were just like listening to someone who told them what to play. Spoiler: they did that for this tournament as well, uh, and ended up playing Elves and was the victor. But we'll we'll get to that later. Um, I uh. Well, so I know that uh, I think it's Martin Dominguez, who uh, is a moto grinder who played a lot of oops. And I think some of the other oh, sure. uh, Spanish or Spanish speaking mm-hmm. grinders were a big fan of that deck. So it would not surprise me if, if actually uh, played that on on their recommendation uh, to get to this event. And then once they had more reps under their belt, felt more comfortable kind of uh, 
you know, choosing a deck from, from within that. Right. So the on uh, that was January. There was ironically not one in February. I don't know why. And then there was one in March and one in April. I, I literally don't know why there wasn't one in February. But, you know, it's MTGO. You just roll with the schedule. <laughs> Um, I guess if if they're trying to have it be a, a quarterly thing, or, yeah. or rather have three it, exactly. cycles in a year, then you have three top eights feeding an event that happens every four months. Uh, you know, one month gets lost in the shuffle there, so not too surprising. Right. Uh, so this month, you actually see a repeat top eater, but I think uh, this was after the ban occurred. Yes. The Arcanist yeah. is no longer legal. So they still top eighted with... You know, Rug Delver, even after losing, like, two broken cards in the deck. And, you know, that's kind of a... That's a dedication to the deck, I think. Or it's just an indication that the deck is that good, and maybe it didn't even need it the entire time, you know? Take, take and if someone, if someone has both experience with Rug Delver and has yeah. succeeded with it in both uh, pre- and post-Arcanist worlds, you have to think they're almost certainly just playing Rugged Elf again for this event, right? Yeah, I think this person played Stifle even the Arcanist days. Oh, no, they didn't. But they switched to playing Stifle after the ban, which, you know, actually makes a little bit of sense. Um, and, you know, uh, spoiler, you know, Mechon T, this person has incredible range, you know. They play lands. I saw them get a 5 with Painter, like Mono Red Painter, and um, I think Zio Fracone is Italian, I believe, and also has a pretty wide range. I, I saw, see them playing all sorts of weird blue decks. Um, Utley26, on the other hand, I don't know if you know this person IRL. They're named Jack Kitchen. They basically only play two decks, and it's Painter and Dredge. Interesting. So, um, get, before this tournament, I saw that most of their finishes were with Painter, and I actually saw posts on the source saying that they were excited about Rip Apart. So just assume they were playing white red painter, you know. So did you uh, d did you have a separate column, or I guess you could just cross reference with the actual results for what people did show up with, just to see how well your predictions lined up. I have a different spreadsheet for that. Rather, I have the spreadsheet that Joe Dyer collected that showed yeah. all of the data uh, from that thing, and I will you know click to that later. I believe there's a public-facing version of that that I can click on. Let me check real quick. But I think I, I, I think I got it almost perfectly. It's just I actually didn't think Patchy would show up with the Oops again. I think that was just so unlikely. I mean, I, th I think that was just like a one and done deal, you know? Yeah. And you know, I was I was correct there. I actually did not know what they were on except someone told me on Saturday that they played against Patchy in a league and they were playing lands. I'm like that's fine. I know how to play that matchup, you know, not inside out, obviously, but like pretty damn well, I would say. I don't think it's obvious at all, Jarvis. I think you know it inside and out. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Um, any case, yeah, I don't know. You know, Utley played Painter. Spoiler: White Red was correct. Storm Guy, I think, did play Rug or Blue Red. To me, Rug and Blue Red are actually pretty close in power level. I just think having Tarmogoyf in those Delver Mirrors is kind of broken, to be fair. It's basically just unkillable bat past, like, turn two. You know, a 3-4 is, like, you have to spend two cards on it, or you have to half submerge, and, you know, a lot of things have to go right. Mm -hmm. Um, So there were a bunch of... This R actually indicates Red Stompy, and I think it was the Firefox Squad deck, if I remember right. It was a Firefox Squad deck. Well, you know, it's a peculiar card, but this deck was running around because of Basuda, an MT, uh, a Japanese player who made it popular. If you remember that as well. Yes, yeah, someone who, whenever I join a, a Legacy Challenge, I just price in a loss mentally to this deck, whether it's in the hands of Basuda, who has uh, bopped me many times before, or <laughs> someone else, because you know, this deck is very straightforward and i think very good as well and mm -hmm. i actually think the weakest part of this deck is the five flux squad I, I don't know if i agree that, with that too actually <laughs> i don't know if that's what you want over you know those bone crusher giants that are in the sideboard or you know chandra torta defiance which you see often as the kind of curve topping four drop for the deck. but the what i what i love here is the lock pieces in this deck whether it's you mm -hmm. know chalice trinisphere blood moon even makers of the moon None of those have been printed more recently than like 2006, right? Th that 
<laughs> that part of the deck you could have played at like a legacy GP 15 years ago. The one thing that has changed is all the threats got a lot better. So you don't have to play stuff like Ragdoll's Pit Dragon anymore. You know, you, you actually get to play real magic cards. So Sam Party in the chat saying, I don't understand the Firefox squad at all. To be fair, I don't really either, because most of the time I've seen it happen, it just hits like it just hits like a random gray ogre or something, you know? I mean the I think the actual joke is if you hit one of the war bosses or rabble masters or garrisons or something like that, your next turn is so much more explosive. But you know, you're just I don't think this card makes a lot of sense. I still don't understand it. I still yeah. I didn't understand it to begin with and I still don't understand it after like three months of playing against this card, you know? I, if I get to resolve a Rabble Master and it survives and I get to follow up with a four drop or something, then as Sam says, that could literally be like Hellrider or I don't know, even Hero <laughs> of Oxid Ridge or something, or just the Chandras that you would naturally play in this deck if you were building it uh, yourself anyway. Oh yeah, I, I think if I were playing this deck, I would play Angie's Ravenger. Uh, how, I don't remember how to pronounce it. I much prefer Angie's Ravager. All right, there we go. I much prefer this card because I think this card is so good when you're when you're like hellbent. Like it's at least just a draw three and it does something appreciably different than the rest of your deck, you know. Yeah. Also they work well in multiples. I didn't realize that until now. They have madness for one and a red. So you can just discard a second one to the first one and you know just put into play. <laughs> I thought you meant you could draw three cards and then discard them all and draw another three cards, but no, maybe that's, that's not what you so <laughs> That's Ox of Agonis or whatever. Uh, it, joking aside, that's Red Prison. Um, this person, VCF, I, hmm, I'm i trying to remember. I think they also have good results at some event. Oh, yeah, they just played Stock Grixis. You know, I, I would consider the Stock Grixis even though, like... Stifle is, like, hit or miss in these decks, in my opinion. So I generally don't play Stifle because I think... Hmm, how do I put it? It's good at creating space, but I don't think that's what this deck wants to do. Like, you play Stifle to create a mana advantage, essentially. But a lot of the times, it doesn't... It's so unreliable versus a lot of decks, you know? And I would say Grixis Delver itself is not really stock anymore, right? Yeah. Like, that deck had a brief moment in the sun just after the bans, where people were exploring different things. But it seems like most of the, the Delver focus has either gone back to Rug or to this more aggressive... Uh, blue red shell uh, Grixis is kind of being left by the wayside alright so slay it with roses um, this person I think plays a deck that I think you can get way more behind um, yeah. Chandra Torch of Defiance just phenomenal card from uh, Kaladesh although I don't what the hell is this one from this is the uh, the signature spellbook version oh, I want to say okay got it got and it. actually if you mouse over fiery confluence I think you'll probably see the same thing yeah oh. there we go is this one of Chandra's signature spells then? Well, she's in the art, Jarvis. Okay, but on NTGO, if you cast this one, do you get to see what modes are, modes are chosen? Probably not. Uh, unclear. <laughs> uh, unclear if they, they got around to fixing um, that one yet with so, their, uh, their skeleton maintenance crew. What I like about this build specifically is I think Bone Crusher Giant is so good in these decks because it gives you interaction where this deck doesn't really usually get to play it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I've had a lot of games against uh, these prison decks where um, they, they get a lock piece down, but it's after I already have something on the board and now I need that something to cross the finish line. And if they have any way to interact with it, then I'm just I'm just daft. The, the yep. game is over. And uh, so, you know, Chandra is good for that, but also Bonecrusher Giant often, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they Delver plays turn one Delver, you play turn one lock piece, they flip their Delver, and now you can still lose the game despite resolving your lock piece. But if you have have a way to build it and then follow up with a threat then then that's yeah. perfect so yeah bone crusher giant a a big pick up here there was a a giant tribal list of mono red prison that had like a uh, crystalline yeah, giant I've... and quake bringer calamity bearer and so on i think that's more of a meme than a, than a natural good deck but uh sh shows you how how good the basic core is well i i lost that deck but i'm gonna tell you i didn't really lose to anything besides calamity bearer and the lock pieces because actually, it turns out Calamity Bearers stack very well in multiples. You die very fast. Yeah. Yo, we got a sub from Mr. Snuffleupagus. How do you feel about Snuffleupagus on average? Love them. Big fan. Um, 
I, I will note here, uh, compared to the more creature heavy build that we saw with Basuza, this deck has Ensnaring Bridge in the sideboard. And that's yep. a card which uh, fell out of favor in the days of Oko, where just Agreed. Oko itself yeah. would embarrass Ensnaring Bridge. But with Oko gone, that card actually comes back into the picture in a big way. And there are some decks that just completely struggle to beat that card ever. Um, so uh, something that you know, if you face Mono Red Prison and you know they don't have Bridge because the stock list mm -hmm. that you know they're playing doesn't have it, in a lot of cases, that is so much less scary than where you might just lose the game to uh, to Snowy Bridge. It's another one of these lock pieces which wins by itself. But you, there are some signposts that generally if you get Fiery Confluence in game one, that's an indication that they're more likely to have Snowy Bridge and yeah. so forth. Because it doesn't make sense to play Fiery Confluence in a deck full of Legion War Bosses and Realm Mousers, even though this person is doing it. Um, it, the, the Fiery Confluence is an indication that you're more likely to play against an Ensnaring Bridge in a post-board game. Mm -hmm. The 1-3 ball is just the 4-3 ball. That's, I mean, it, it is weird to play 3-1, and one, but I'm sure they just wanted another threat or another interaction piece. I don't think it's that weird. Gyroscope that... Smashing, I think, is actually an insanely good pickup for these decks. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think the 4th Trinosphere might be something where there's a big difference between how good it is on the play versus on the draw. And mm -hmm. so you're kind of moving it in or out based on that. And yeah, Shadow Skull Smashing, as as you said, a removal spell after you've locked the game up. There's also a another red source you can play without flooding. And also a red source, crucially, that you can... For Chrome on Mox. Yep. Yeah. I was going to say, you know what the problem with the Mountain is? You can't imprint it on Chrome Mox, but this one cheats. This is, this is big cheats. So uh, MDFC is rearing their ugly head. You know, Throne of Eldraine really just rearing its ugly head. <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. It's just, you know, those sets are so good. Um, it, it, it You're still seeing the effects of it, you know. All right, this person qualified with this deck. I did not expect him to play this deck again. This deck looks super weird and... Uh, well, I mean, I guess it doesn't look super weird. But what I would say about it is it looks really underpowered. If that's that's how I would put it. Yeah, I, I don't think Standstill has aged at all well in, <laughs> in Legacy these days. Once you decide you want to play a Standstill deck, I think uh, you know, this build makes a lot of sense. You can see how they got there, but I, I just would disagree with the basic premise. I think you know, if you want to play a slower blue-white controlling deck, maybe blue-white miracles, that's fine, but I, I don't really see the reason to go this route. I don't either, but you know, good on them. They made top eight of that tournament. You know, r realistically, like a deck with cantrips and you know, force of will, and like Shark Typhoon is fine if you play a lot of blue mirrors. And you know, the Planeswalkers are good, so you know, you can string together wins. I just think at the end of the day, you can do much better than this deck most of the time. Yeah. Right. Um, and this was the last one in April, and wow, this one was a. Uh, this one was a wild one, although, you know, you, you see Sylvia uh, winning it, although, spoiler, they did not do great yesterday. I think they went literally 5 which is uh, a tough pill to swallow. But, you know, like I said, these fields are tough, you know. It, it's not like you're going to get as many free wins there as you do uh, in in those events. Um. Anyways, yeah, Sylvia, uh, Japanese player, I, I've watched their stream sometimes. They stream, like... At convenient times when I'm on like a work call or whatever, but I don't have to pay attention, so I'll have a stream open and they'll be playing basically a Delver variant every time. And that that's just them. That's they'll do that forever. So I think it's pretty safe to lock them in for whatever Delver Del, Delver variant they've been playing the most, pretty much. Uh was there anything special about this one? Oh yes, this is the Sprite Dragon Splash Clothis deck. Which is a really weird way to do it, but also makes some sense. Um, because then you get to play with all of the basic lands, you know? Yeah, I, there's there's a lot going on in this deck. I think that this deck's like this deck's delvers just have to be so much worse than the average delver in, you know, the, the stock rug list or the stock blue red list, right? Where your spell counts lower and some of your spells are more conditional and clunky and it just seems like you're giving up some of the natural advantages of Delver in terms of just like being sleek and efficient mm -hmm. in order to get some of these you know chunkier threats in the deck. Well, you mean the fourth throne of Elnarine threats and the spell <laughs> yes. whale and a snapcaster? This is a this you, is 
it, it, Travis, it, look at this specific uh, list right here. We're splashing off one tropical island for one Clothis and one Sylvan Library, yeah. and I guess half of an Ancient Grudge. Yeah, it looks really weird. This is not how I would build a deck, but you know, they do what they want, and they, they're generally pretty successful uh, about it most of the time. Yeah, I, it's 26 versus 28, so it's a little bit worse, but it is worse. Um, elves, you know, I, I don't know how to say a lot about this deck without saying that I think Allosaurus Shepherd really supercharges this deck and is really the reason you see it came back. It's funny that it gets labeled as Wuberg by default just because of the one progenesis in the cycle. <laughs> I, I, every time I see that, it makes me laugh. But it, it's not a five color deck. I mean, I have caught Casper Janus off Birch Core Rangers a non zero number of times, but that's not the goal of the deck. If you've drawn for Janus, you're generally pretty sad, just like Ross and every all of the finals he's lost with elves. Yeah, but uh, otherwise, fairly uh, stock ish mm -hmm. elves list for the most part. But my question to you is how do you feel about the number of once upon a time? I've seen it going from zero to four, and I'm not sure how to feel about it anymore, to be quite fair. I think it's an excellent card in the deck. The trouble is, it kind of competes for space with everything else, where right. if you cut into the creatures, they're all either somewhat essential for the combo plan, and mm -hmm. if you're going off with Glimpse, let's say you need a high density of one drops to, to keep that chain yeah. going. Um, you, I guess you could cut like the one main that scavenging use, because that's like a fairly conditional uh, Zenith target. Um, but And then you, you can't really cut into the spells either, because you need Zenith, of course. I already think three natural order is too low. I, I've always liked having the four. Yep. And then if you're building to be a glimpse deck, then you kind of want four glimpse. Although, you know, I, I seem to be the only person who thinks that's up for debate. But, you know, if you want four glimpse, then you can't cut that either. And mm -hmm. I guess you get to the point where you start shaving lands uh, for more copies of Once Upon a Time. But that's already risky in this deck because you just don't have that many lands, right? right. Like you, you look at this mana base, it's... 17 land plus two dry diaper, but four of those lands are guys' cradles, which can't cast a spell on turn one. Um, so you only have 13 actual lands, which is already really on the low side, and I don't think you can cut into that number any further. So I, I think you would like to play more than two copies of one small time, but there just simply is not any room. Um, and as uh, someone says in the chat, like drawing the second copy can often be kind of disastrous as well. So uh, I, I think the first two are good, but I don't know if it's easy to fit any more than that. And yeah, I, I agree with you and all of the points. And the first time you draw a Dried Arbor, Gaia's Griddle Hand, and five spells, you'll know exactly what we mean. Because well, first off, if you're going to keep that hand, generally what's actually correct to do is play Cradle first, then turn to play the Arbor, and then tap your Cradle. Unless you know exactly your opponent's playing a deck that cannot interact with Dried Arbor. In which case, then you can play the Arbor first, and obviously it's so much better. But... Otherwise, if you're going to keep that hand, you should do the other thing. But you know, more realistically, you should just go to London Town, where, you know, Dom's been to London Town many times, literally and figuratively speaking. Yeah, I do think that, for example, Elves is good against Delver, but a big subset of the games where you lose is where mm -hmm. you have to keep this dodgy one on hand, and you just get wastelanded into the Shadow Realm. So I, I, I don't really like anything that exacerbates that problem either. So, um, yeah, once upon a time, uh amazingly underplayed card in legacy i think like i see uh the green white depth deck doing well which warms my heart but the the popular list of that now doesn't play once upon a time which is yeah. kind of absurd to me um i i think that's just a, a an amazing and underexplored card in legacy but that's a, a topic for another time yeah so elves you know that person did well in that tournament and i expected them to do it the daddy i believe they are from uh i think they live in london and they always play Dredge or Hogax, so uh, I kind of just wrote them off as doing it. I don't know their real name, but I, I kind of just expected them to play Dredge again. It's first name the last name Daddy, Jarvis. It's, it's right there on the screen. Uh, anyways, this deck is... This almost looks super stock to me, although I'm not a Dredge expert anymore. There's nothing that really jumps out as being weird to me except three Icarids in the main deck, but I don't know. There's... I, Again, I'm not a dredge expert. I can't really tell you like why there would be three Icarids instead of four Icarids in the main deck. I think it might just be a space concern again. Sure. Like, what, what are we cutting for another Icarid? 
Lotus Petal. I mean, I, Lotus Petal is so good in this deck, though. Like, yeah. you, you kind of want more, and then we already don't have room for stuff like Ox of Agonis, or, uh, you know, there are so many other cards we could still be playing. Um, I, you could cut the Hogak, but then Hogak itself adds this new dimension to the deck as well. So, uh, also, there just isn't that much fuel for Icarid either, because you have your eight dredges, like the Thug and the, the Imp, mm. um, and then you have three Putrid Imp, so already having to cut into those numbers. Mm-hmm. I guess you have the other copies of Icarid, and then you have the the Hogak and the Ashen Rider, but you kind of want to cast the Hogak, and you kind of want to Dread Return the Ashen Rider, so uh, it's it's just hard to find room for all this stuff. I think it's really interesting that these decks have moved away from Flamekin Zealot, if you remember that in the old days. Yeah. It's it's so interesting that that like I think it's probably correct, but I just think it's really interesting that you know Legacy is in a place where okay, it doesn't matter if you have Flame Gonzalez in your deck or not. I can probably just you know uh, you know make a Hogak, Dread Return, a Grave Troll, or Therapy yeah. you a bunch of times, and that's I, good enough on average. The the argument was always. Okay, so if you need to win exactly this turn, then sometimes Zealot can get you across the finish line. But how often does it come up that that wins you the game, but uh, you're getting a massively lethal uh, board presence and Mm -hmm. casting therapy two or three times won't win the game, right? Um, Versus if you want a a kind of more niche Dread Return target, then Ashen Rider is often the one thing that you're judging towards to get you out of a specific uh, problem. Off glacial chasm. <laughs> oh god, yeah. That I mean, also just Marilage as well. Can, yeah, yeah, can be no, an issue yeah. Or just... This card's literally good versus Marilage because it's in Yeah, yeah. But th- I think this is smart. This is like an answer card in the deck that happens to work well in the deck. You know. Also, sometimes you just draw that naturally against Show and Tell, and they can't possibly win. But that's uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So Dredge, not a deck that gets uh much publicity or many results in general but you see these one or two people who like always play dredge and always do decently so at that point you kind of mentally lock them in on a deck like that so maybe dredge maybe hogak but some kind of graveyard deck at least so this is a true mid-range delver deck and what i mean by that is look at its mana curve look at its mana base and look at the spells it's trying to cast and you can tell that this person really really wants to play like I would call this modern style Delver, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, this is it, this isn't like a traditional rug Delver deck where yeah. I'm going to keep my curve as low as humanly possible, and mm-hmm. that's the unique selling point of my deck. This is almost a uh, it's kind of an efficient ish tempo deck, um, mm-hmm. but and we have Delvers just as a premier threat. But it's not yep. like a Delver deck that takes that Xerox uh, principle to the extreme. What the the thing I love is, you know, Throne of Eldraine still rearing its ugly head here. <laughs> We've seen so many Bone Crusher Giants and Brazen Borrowers in these decks. And just keep in mind, those guards are still legal and standard, and it's still going to be until, you know, September or whatever. It's it, it, it just kind of amazes me how strong those cards are still. Yeah, I, I, I do love that we have, like, two Bone Crusher Giant, two Trina Nemesis, and then two OG Literal Counterspell just hanging out there in the uh, in the spell section. Uh, interesting thing to note is cleansing wildfire in the sideboard i'm not a huge fan of that card but sometimes that card is backbreakingly good um in some of the delver mirrors people don't play basic land so that can just be a cantrip sinkhole um i think it's more impactful to use that card versus say hmm lands it's it's pretty good versus lands because i think most lands opponents just fetch up their forests so then you cast Wildfire and it's just Cantrip Sinkhole, you know? Yeah, like, it, usually the, the the base blue-red Delver decks have mm-hmm. access to Blood Moon if they want to go into that effect. Yep. There is a massive difference between 2-mana and 3-mana, and yep. also between, you know, a card that you can reveal to Delver and a card that you can't, and then yep. uh, even in the, the blue-red deck, sometimes you get screwed by your own Blood Moon or you can't fetch in a way that really enables it. So I, I think Wildfire is... It has a, a lower ceiling than Blood Moon, certainly, but if you just want something that can blow up a land, I, I think Wildfire is a, a good starting point. Yep. So, or just a fourth wasteland, which you could play instead, but whatever. <laughs> so this person also qualified with Basuda Red. We mostly talked about everything. Well, were there four Bone Crushers and two Torpurbs in the other list as well? Don't I, actually I don't, remember. I don't think so. I've seen both of those in various numbers in previous Basuta yep. decklists. 
Uh, so no surprise to see them there. Uh, Torpor Orb, uh, your best card against Doomsday, but also against stuff like uh, Death, Death and Taxes, Taxes Esper Vile. Moya. Yeah. I played against this card from a, from the Giant Stompy deck as Death and Taxes. Actually, that's the real reason I lost. They Torporved me and then just played a bunch of big creatures. Death and Taxes, if you reduce all of their creatures having no come to play effects, it's just a deck full of two mana 1-2s and three mana 1-1s. One, it can never win versus like a 3-4. Yeah, it's a deck full of embarrassing creatures and then they play a Torpor, but now they're even more embarrassing. So, Alright. Uh, oh, kill SUV. You know what you're in for here. This is... It yeah, still so drives me nuts! Easy. I'm uh, still mad! I'm actually still mad. <laughs> I, I think I've been on this rant forever. Why does this deck play four voltaic key, two manifold key? You, it you has four have... current sign of Urza in the sideboard! Right, I, I was just about to say. <laughs> it, it really does... I, like maybe if there was a manifold key in the sideboard to cardfold, but there isn't. There isn't even that, so it's just strictly inferior. But it's, then it should be baffling. three manifold key, three right. voltaic key, one manifold V in the sideboard. I'm literally just losing it because I actually made that comment before mana traders. I'm like, oh, all these decks play two manifold key, three, four voltaic key. I think it makes no goddamn sense. Uh, it's just you... literally like. Do you want to lose a game where you could have just attacked with an unblockable twelve twelve construct under no, under like some weird like board stall where you could have easily won just by like sneaking it through twice? Are you are you molding, Jarvis? No, because I have too much hair for that. <laughs> I actually need a haircut, so I'd like to mold a little bit to get oh, rid of some crack. of the hair. Um, but uh, all joking aside, besides that point, this deck is really good if you're not prepared for it. But spoiler, it's not that difficult to prepare for this deck. This deck literally cannot beat Null Rod on, without Karn, Sign, and Verza, in my opinion. This is uh, one of that family of decks, which I, I don't like playing against Delver, and I think that Delver kind of gets a free pass in many respects, but if you remove Delver from the format, you would be playing against a lot more of stuff like this, and I, I don't know if that's a, a better play experience for anyone either. So uh, I mean, you, you have to pick your poison in that regard. In my mind, this is similar to belcher but it's more resilient than belcher is how i would put it yeah uh yeah gsc into oof easy peasy except they do play skyboat so like the deck can actually beat oof but not null rod actually i was having a conversation with someone lately and a friend of them asked my other friend okay why don't people play collector oof over null rod and this is one of the major reasons not to do that a lot of the time literally sky yeah. sovereign console flagship Sky Sovereign, and then some lists have like Dismember or Spatial Contortion uh, as well, so uh, just something to keep in mind there. This I mean, is just it, a banned it, vintage deck? Well, it's missing the Lynchpin card, which is Mitra's Workshop in my opinion, but... I mean, you get to play for uh, Cut the Great Creator, which is always nice. And for Three, Mystic Eddie, Forge. Yeah. These are both restricted in vintage. I guess this is restricted. This Those is title, restricted. Yeah. Um... Okay, I guess it plays a lot of cards that are restricted, which is a good sign for a deck, but then it also, yeah. it does share some of the same vulnerabilities that Artifact decks do in Vintage, which is, it's, Null Rod and Collector Reef are quite good versus the deck. It's a super cool deck. I think the initial hype has not really borne out. I think people have mostly kind of moved off it now, but there was a period where you would play against that deck all the time in, in the leagues. Um so I, I'm kind of glad that that uh, that era has passed now. And then Phil Helmuth. Uh, <laughs> Sam Rolf. Sam Rolf himself, who is not like a known <laughs> lands enthusiast, but just picked up lands and, you know, he can win with a ham sandwich. So, of course, he uh, qualified uh, for the tournament with it. It's funny because I look at so many things about this deck and I hate so many of the micro decisions. And then I asked him after the tournament if he thought the deck was good. And he's like, it was super average. I would not play it again. Which yeah, is a really funny way to put it, but I, it's exactly what I expected him to say. And also, I still am molding that these people played three Dark Depths, two Fields yes. of Dead. I think it's so awful to do that for a lot of reasons, but no one else agrees with me. So I'm left questioning my Sandy late at night while I'm trying to fall asleep in bed. Jarvis, I, I, I agree with you, but maybe that leaves you questioning your sanity even more. I don't know. Yeah, you're not. You have a lot of like weird ideas that turn out to be very wrong and weird. Okay, not all of them. Just I would say like forty percent of them turn out to be weird and wrong. Is that fair? But yeah, that's fifty percent. Those are great. You can take those to the bank. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, the 
I guess I'll elaborate why I hate playing three Dark Depths, two Field so much. Okay, first up, Field of the Dead is tapped. That's a tap land. Dark Depths doesn't tap for mana, but Dark Depths is good in all of your bad matchups. And what I mean by that is combo. You don't beat any of those combo decks without literally turboing them. Yeah, you are a literal turbo depth deck against uh, any kind of combo, especially in game one. Um, and the, the second field, like the first field, really, is only good against exactly kind of miracles or blue soup decks in very long games. And so I don't know why you really need to have that effect. And you, you could always just sideboard the second copy, I think, if you really want yep. to show up those matchups. Um, whereas, yeah, there, there's a whole swathe of the format where it's a bigger portion first of all and you need a lot more help there than you do with the second field uh, a few more notes about this list is one field is actually similar to playing two because once you get one you can just stage a bunch of them and then it doesn't really matter how many are in your that deck too. yeah like i guess it, it makes it easier to find the first one but if the game is going that long to where the first one would be active you have a lot of time well oh, one issue with that exactly that um sentiment is a lot of the games especially post board games your loams are under attack so it's not that easy to find field sometimes so it is nice to naturally draw one i think in post board games all of the time as well sure um one a few other notes friends don't let friends play drop of honey anymore that card is aged unbelievably bad uh five blasts is a weird metagame call i think i wouldn't play more than like three because the, the reason to actually play Blast, in my mind, is to counter for some negation. But, like, realistically, how many Blasts do you actually need for that? I don't think there's five. I think that's just, like, overkill. Yeah, I think if you expect the Delver decks to all become, like, Blue-Red, where Pyroblast hits basically all of the major threats, minus stuff like, you know, Young Pyromancer in some lists, um, you know, if you can Pyroblast Sprite Dragon and or Ethereal Forager, maybe Brazen Borough, I think that's a really good place to be. Against specifically Rug, where they have stuff like uh, Hexdrinker, which can be a problem, Tarmogoyf, Hooting Mandrels, uh, you know, Clothis is going to be an issue in, in longer games, maybe. Uh, at, at that point, Power Blast loses a lot of its effectiveness. Yeah. And I actually think in... Like, I don't think Lands is a deck that mulligans all that well, first of all. And I think the cost of getting stranded with a dead card can be fairly substantial, especially when you can't rely on recovering that via Loam, or you can't you know, against Delver, you can't rely on sticking, you know, a Sylvan Library or a Valakar Exploration, even if you have however many copies of those left in your deck still. So, um, I, I don't think you can just, like, fill your deck with a, a stack of Fire Blast and expect that to be good. Well, yeah, so, like, the core issue is, Lands is not really a deck about trying to one-for-one one its opponent. It doesn't really work out very well for all of the reasons you listed. One thing I would disagree with is, I do think Lands mulligans well, the issue is if you get force mitigation, then all of your mulligan is like yeah. kind of out the window. Yeah. Um, I think if you knew you wouldn't get fawned, then I would happily mull to like four a lot of games and probably still be like in a reasonable spot. But it, it really it's force mitigation's fault that this deck I think became a lot worse because a lot of the games were, it won versus blue decks were predicated on the fact that okay, you counter sold me once, I don't care. You counter sold me twice, I still don't care. Oh, you're out now? Well, now you're just going to lose in a long game. So what you're saying is that false negation is unfair and Blue got too much that year. Um, I believe some people would say that, but I don't know those people. And th that sounds ridiculous, like, to make that your your slogan. <laughs> I don't... That sounds weird as hell. All right, um... It's weird, mate. Yeah. BMJ? It, someone from the UK? Uh, ben Jones, someone who uh, I was meant to team with for a team GP, who who snaked me and then won that GP. So uh, you know, <laughs> not fantastic about that. Uh, but, uh, a a man of few words, but usually what he has to say is is very smart and an excellent player. Uh, not someone I really expected to play Hogak, honestly. Um, you know, he uh, plays a lot of Shadow in Modern and drove a lot of the innovation with that deck. So we'd kind of expect him to be drawn to, I mean, either Legacy Shadow, first of all, or just uh, you know, a Delver deck of some description. But, um, you know, snuck his way in here with Hogak. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I would have also penciled him in on that for the, the showcase event as well. Um, but that's that's a puzzle for, for these small field tournaments, right? It's, it's hard to yeah. predict. Well, so I think the tying factor here is that he's friends with Nam. I think is the actual answer of how this came to be. Namor Squats, who also qualified for this event. Spoiler. 
Um, I, I think this is just super stock. You've we've talked so much about Hogak in the past. I don't think there's much interesting to say here. So we'll just carry yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, this is a deck list from like pre Kaldheim, pre bands. You yeah. know, nothing really has changed <laughs> in that regard. So these last three people, um, I don't have the exact list here, but it was the LCQ week where you could spend 40 QPs and a bunch of play points. And if you went 5-0, and you qualified. Um, so these are the three people who did it. Uh, Nam with Hogak, Omega UO with Bant Control, and Gob FTW with Blue Red Midrange Delver. They also played the same deck in Mana Traders, which is another data point. Um, I think it's... Specifically for these small tournament events, it's important to just keep looking week to week and see if they switch. And if they don't switch, then it's more likely that they'll just keep going, you know? Yeah, I think one of the... Uh, so looking at this field, one thing that stands out is there are quite a few people who either did play graveyard decks or could play graveyard decks. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the the ways in which you attack those decks doesn't overlap fully, so against uh oops for example you know uh force negation can be a great card uh but not always against dredge force negation is excellent mm -hmm. against hogak force negation often is pretty bad so um the you know obviously if you have stuff like uh cage or crypt or leyline or whatever you're going to bring that in but beyond that the details kind of get a bit murky and you know let, let's take exactly surgical extraction as an example fantastic against oops often one of the best cards you can have against oops uh, mm -hmm. good against Dredge and often kind of ineffective actually against Hogak. So um, depending on how many graveyard decks you expect and how you think they're going to be distributed among that range, uh, that might inform what kind of hate you want. And then that, of course, depends in turn on what deck you're playing yourself. So tying all of this together, I looked at a bunch of, I, I mean, I basically clicked through weeks of results and, you know, finally just decided that this is the most likely thing for each of these people with the caveat that I didn't want to, like, if I wrote on Grixis Delver, it could very easily be Blue Red or Rog, you know. It's those, in my mind, are not easy. They're not difficult for people to switch back between. But a lot of the decks, I was, I was like, fairly confident that a lot of people would pick these decks. Um, the, the Patsy one, I was less confident on, so I kind of just, like, put a question mark next next to that in my head and honestly with sam i just had no freaking idea like he's a freaking yeah. he's a he's a loose cannon is how i would put it he, he sure is yeah uh, um <laughs> i i would also predict that uh you would see more movement towards so let, let's say someone qualified with rug delver yeah i think they're less likely to switch away from that deck given just how generically solid it is versus if you qualified with a deck that's a little bit more off the wall you might either switch to another deck trying to exploit uh, the field that you expect, or you might just decide, I want something that is generically solid, so I'm going to play Rug Delver or, you know, something a little bit more established. Yeah. Um, uh, I agree with that. Kenji was also a wild card for me because he actually doesn't have that many legacy results, and I think he is definitely the type of player that if you gave him a week to practice with any deck, he could learn it to a reasonable amount of competency. Like, if... If if one of his legacy friends told him to play elves, I think he could definitely just switch in a week, you know. And so I didn't want to overspecify there. Um, there's a concept in statistics called robustness. So I wanted my deck to be robust to me misspecifying the metagame by a little bit. So I didn't want to completely overtune, but I wanted to tune close enough to this, but have some allowance for people just altering their preferences. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I almost considered playing two main deck Pyroblast in this tournament. Spoiler, I played one. But I decided two was a little bit too much. Uh, even though, if you do look at this expectation that, you know, Blast main deck looks pretty damn good, right? Yeah, it's... <laughs> it's a kind of thing where you get paired against, like, elves into mm -hmm. death and taxes or something, and end up you're regretting all of your life decisions but yep. knowing that those life decisions were made with you know a good estimate of the odds in mind so how bad can you really fail yeah so i i i we'll, we'll get to the deck list in a sec but i'll i'm just going to compare this uh let's see this way to do this paste it over here i do that oh this is a view only uh it's easier to paste this over here and move this here. 
Now, spoiler, one thing I actually messed up on, I somehow left out Slay with Roses in my predicted sorted <laughs> meta. You know, and uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm not perfect, but I actually would have predicted that they played Red Prison. But the thing that did affect me was I only thought there was one Red Prison deck. If there, if I'd known there had been two, I might have played one more sideboard card for them hmm. or something like that. So it, it actually is kind of bad that I didn't do it. My prediction would have been the same, but you know, I, I did mess it up. Uh, Interesting. So we can, with the power of sorting, compare it directly by sort by the correct column. Uh, BMG, BMJ Hogak. Uh, Baku 91, Rugged Over, Grizzly Silver, that's close. BS, BCS, Bant. Duke 12, Rugged Over, my prediction was Blue Red, that's close. Aaron, DNT. Aaron, DNT. Fluffy, Elves, Elves. Blue Red, Blue Red. Rug, Rug. Mystic, Forge, Mystic, Forge. Uh, that. Uh, there's a me, but it should be Mention T lands, Mention T lands, which is right. Sure. Blue Red, Blue Red. So I think I did a really good job, except for, well, I did Patsy. Yeah. Patsy, not great. Phil Helmuth, I, well, whatever. I Obviously, I'm excluding myself. But I think I did a pretty, oh, Steve MLP switched from Red Prison to Bant Food Chain. I'm like, okay, I didn't see that one coming. But, you know, it, it, that's that's the danger of overtuning, you know? Yeah, you can't expect to, to get all of it right. But, uh, yeah, it, it looks like you did a, an excellent job there. Zero for Kone is switching to Amitel. Uh, spoiler, I ended up playing them. Their build was really weird. I did not expect that, but it not, doesn't surprise me because the version that we saw in Mana Traders was actually much better versus Delver than I think the average Omnitel deck is. Interesting. Um, so I think I did a pretty good job predicting. So, okay. Now the question is, what deck do I play with this predicted meta where I was basically correct? I decided the answer was to inbreed my Rug Delver deck based on Stefan's deck from Mana Traders, which I also came originally from Daniel Gottschall. Although Daniel uh, does not great sideboard things, so I <laughs> I had to fix the problems I perceived with his deck to get to somewhere where I was happy, then change based on this expected metagame. So let's let's finally go look at the deck list. So, well, let's uh. So so just on that, realistically, was there a chance? Uh, depending on let's say the expected meta game looked a lot different. What yeah. would need to happen for you not to think that Delvo of some kind was a choice here? Um, I think if there was a lot more, hmm, what is it? I, a it's, lot it's, more. Uh, hold on. the The actual exploit that I was actually considering was actual turbo depths. To be fair. Ah. Okay. Well, so, so I, I think that's actually a much. I, I mean, I, I'm keen to look over the Delver list for sure. But I think that nugget of information itself is maybe the most interesting thing that's emerged from this so far. So, so why why was that the exploit uh, in your mind? So in my mind, there are a lot of Delver decks, and I don't I don't think Delver versus Turbo Depths is a matchup you're that excited to play, especially if you play a version that doesn't play any forest with like stifles and fluster storms and stuff like that. And the th other thing is Turbo Deck is actually reasonably good for his combo. Um the deck that Turbo Depths is actually bad against, in my opinion, are like the Plow, Caracas, like Uro decks. Yeah. Like Death and Daxes is kind of not great, and like Bant Control with Caracas is super not great for the deck. Yeah, I I don't know how that holds up if it's if the blue red Delver decks that you're facing are like uh, Sprite Dragon, several Brazen Borrowers, uh, you know, a, a more aggressive slant, so you have less time to mm -hmm. set up some kind of a uh, you know crop rotation through their defenses kind of line. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if anything, I'm I'm less scared usually of like the the Tamagoy Pooty Mantle decks and the ones which have, you know, good flying attackers and also good kind of disruptive cards at the same time. Yeah, um, interesting you bring that up. I think generally what happens in those matchups, especially for Turbo, is you don't give them a lot of time to establish multiple flyers. You're trying to, like, do your thing before that happens, or you're going to try to, like, sneak it in through a daze with, a, like, a sneaky spirit guide or something like that, and they're they're not prepared for it, and they lose on the spot because they, like days to pick up their land and then you just spirit guide them and 
well, now their land is gone and they can't play a Sprite Dragon on that turn. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I actually almost pulled the trigger on it. At the end, I didn't find a Turbo Depths list I liked enough to actually pull the trigger on it. I played a lot more slow depths in the past, and it plays a lot differently from Turbo. Turbo is like, I think you basically just mulligan every hand until like you can do the thing. I wasn't like into doing that. Whereas like slow, you're like a rock deck that happens to have dark depths, in it, if that makes more sense. Yeah, I, I guess if the field expected field was like twenty five percent Hogak or something, then you know Delva looks like a, an uphill battle. But um, right. Otherwise, I think one thing I do agree with Daniel on is that Delva just fundamentally is a very sound deck. It yeah. doesn't really have bad matchups in particular. Um, and if you expect, if you really want to hard target something, you can do it. And it's usually much easier for you to do that than it is for any other deck to hard target you. Yeah. Um, were you worried at all about the, the Red Prison matchup with Delva? I think it's generally, how do I put it? I would say it's even, but volatile is the actual yeah. way I would describe the matchup, which is, okay, if you know you're playing against the deck, you can mulligan against it, but at the end of the day, what's going to happen is they're going to force check you a bunch of times, and if you ever run out, you lose. And if you pass the task, then they usually lose. So it's like, I think that makes it an even matchup, but it's also not particularly fun to play, and also a lot of shit can go wrong in the matchup. Yeah. Also. Uh, sorry, my cat is like walking across my keyboard. Uh, cat, <laughs> I, I can you bring the uh the screen share back up? Oh, your cat, your cat disabled it. I think you disabled it. Don't don't blame my cat, Jarvis. No, it it was still sharing. Oh, I'm not seeing anything. How about now? Uh, I'm seeing me on Skype. What? I can try uh, dropping and rejoining the call. How about now? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, I Perfect. I did unshare and reshare twice. I guess the second time did it. Um, but yeah, let's let's just get into the specifics of the list. Someone asked about Hex Drinker. I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so the first version of this list that I had from Daniel had two of this card and three of this card. I'm like, okay, this <laughs> there's there's some real issues with that. Okay. First off, I think those cards fight with each other for space, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. It, like, people act like you could never run out of stuff to escape Earl with, but the reality is you actually do. And it's extra bad with Ethereal Forager being the other one because you really don't want to exile instance or sorceries for your Forager, for, for your Earl to leave for the Forager, essentially. So I think... Three is about the number of delve slash escape threats that I'm willing to play. Not five, not like four. I think three feels fundamentally fine to me. And you see that in other delver decks where you look at the number of hooting mandrills or Gurmag Anglers they play is about three. Um, so just intuitively speaking, that made sense to me. So I wanted to play three of that card. Um, he started with five. He also had like a braid in his main deck and stuff like that. And I'm just like, okay, yeah. I'm not. He went on a whole journey with this deck. There was yeah. a deep period where there was Manamorphos uh, flying around. And he, uh, yeah, he, he put in the work. He went through a lot of different uh, iterations. The one list that intrigued me uh, in that time that I saw was a deck that had a uh, Thought Scour as its tertiary yes. cantrip to kind of yeah. power out like Turbo Whales, if you want to call it that. Um, and I, I don't know that that as an observer who doesn't really play Delva, that that approach appealed to me. But let's talk about the the whale itself quickly because this is a card which increasingly is becoming common in uh, blue red Delva, rug Delva, just Delva of various kinds, and often hailed as one of the uh, the better threats in the deck now, where it wasn't before. So, uh, what has gone into that, and do you agree with that assessment? So. I'll be the first to admit that I was incorrect in assessing this card after the Arcana Span, where I'm like, this card doesn't look very good. I said it basically, it dying to Bolt and Pyroblast and Chain made me not want to play it. But I think that's just a bad argument in retrospect. Um, because what goes on with this card is that, okay, first off, there's a few things going on. It is a card that's really good at grinding, 
Um, especially versus a deck like Elves and Death and Taxes, where your goal in those matchups is to kill literally almost every single thing they play. And Forager allows you to do that a lot easier by either by supplying more cantrips, more interaction, you know, stuff like that. Um, and one thing I actually noticed, playing that card versus bug-style decks, it was really hard for them to remove it. Because you know what its casting cost actually is? It's not three or less. It's six, yeah. Yeah, so, that makes it a pain in the ass for them, actually, which I actually noticed very well as well. Yeah, you, you can't decay that. You can't fatal push it. It's actually really hard to, to get that thing uh, off the board. The, the thing that held me back on it and maybe stopped me from realizing its potential early on was it seemed like if you invest in this card in the Delver Mirror, it's vulnerable mm -hmm. to both Lightning Bolt and Pyroblast. So especially post board right. if that's your your big threat that you're relying on then it seems like that can get bopped uh fairly easily that, that's what i said at the beginning and then i'm just like i thought about it more and i'm just like well it is bad but people used to leave in true names and mirrors and it was just equally bad to get that blasted the difference being that they actually have another turn to be able to blast it not just on the stack they can just like untap and try to kill it well whereas true name if true name gets into play in the delver mirrors it's almost unkillable besides uh, Plague Engineer. But, you know, I think the upside of getting at least one attack in with it, then getting it killed, that's a fine outcome. Because um, you get one card back, like, whether it be a cantrip or interaction spell, or even, like, a force of will just to, like, try to protect it and ride it to victory, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think I was incorrect the first time around, and I think this is really the proxy Dreadhorde Arcanist, is how I would put it. Um, it's not as good, like, don't get me wrong. It's actually worse, but there's actually a few things about it that operate differently from Arcanus that do make it very appealing to me. The first thing I noticed, um, if you play multiple, if you have multiple foragers in your hand, it's actually not that bad, because what happens is, you play the first one, attack with it, get the cantrip back, you cast it, it goes back to the graveyard. So it actually sort of works well in multiples in a weird sort of way. Whereas Arcanus did not really do that. It did not work. I mean, if you had multiple Arcanus and a lot of cantrips, then obviously you were going to win easily. But, you know, sometimes that didn't happen. But the multiple forager thing does happen occasionally. Mm -hmm. So you have two foragers in the deck, one Uro, and then two Hex Drinker as the, the kind of optional threats there. Yep. Do you feel like those are putting you in different directions where maybe Hex Drinker places different incentives on you than uro or forager do or is it that you know e each of them is so individually powerful that even any tension that there might be uh is kind of mitigated and you have so much selection that you can kind of pick and choose which one you want to work towards interesting you ask that it's actually intentional that they pull in different directions and selection also is a part of it because the problem with uro and forager is if you play against a rest in peace deck it's actually your deck is actually really bad versus rest in peace in this configuration Look at how many things are affected if you get ripped. Tarmogoyf, Uro, Forager are all, are all like not great cards. So I wanted to play something that cost one, but was immune to Graveyard Fate. And Hex Drinker, I think, fits that role. There was a time where people would play like four Hex Drinkers and just have that you know, be a, a central feature of the deck. Is that kind of unsustainable nowadays? Or, or what's your stance on that? I think four is too many because drawing two of that card is not particularly great is the real issue. And the the other issue is um, it's pretty vulnerable to like, it's nice to create a window to like level it up safely. But if you draw multiples of it, you can't really do that because like, I mean, you can, but then the second one just doesn't do anything right. Like, I, I think really the second copy being bad is the reason to only play two of that card. Okay. And then looking over the mana base here, we've got uh, a basic island making its way into the deck for the first time. Is that just with the increased focus on Forager, or is there something else going on there? It's Forager and Uro, I think, both make me want to play a single island. And also, like, it it actually prevents you from being exploited by, like, weird random bullshit like Trophy or Ghost Quarter if you play a single island, because then you get to recoup a lot of what's going on. And you, you know there are going to be some Blood Moon decks in this event, so... Right, uh, but oh, let me be clear. If you get Island versus a Blood Moon deck and are only ca able to cast Delvers and Cantrips and, like, 
burn spells. I don't think you're going to win very often. <laughs> right, Still, right. Uh, if you're blue red Dover, obviously you're going to win a lot more often because your deck's designed to operate under Blood Moon. But if this deck gets Blood Moon, it's pretty awful. Um, I'm not going to lie. So uh, l- let's talk about the sideboard then, because I think this is where a lot of the kind of metagaming takes place, well, where you, you, you move slots around depending on what you expect to play against. It, it's not even that. It's actually already in the main deck. Spell Snare, uh, Chain yeah. Lightning, Forked Bolt, Pyroblast. Those cards sometimes show up. More often Forked Bolt. Where people have Brazen Barber, I actually have Spell Snare, Chain Lightning, and Pyroblast. And the reason is, I don't think Brazen Barber is very good in uh, the Delver Mirrors. And let me explain why. Yes, it's nice to like unsummon something, then play it through on flyer to try to like regain tempo. But at the same time, that's like a lot of mana to pay for basically an unsummon and a 3-1 flyer that's like very fragile. I, I don't think Borrower is that good in Mirrors, and I actually tend to decide it out, especially because post-board it's weak to Pyroblast, like extremely weak to Pyroblast. Hmm. And so I, I remember the last time we went over uh, a Rug Delver walkthrough. This, this was actually with the, the showcase list uh, a few months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe you had five burn spells so you know the, the one chain lightning main deck and then mm-hmm. also uh the one pyroblast is that right and so yeah. now we have a sixth burn spell in fort ball and a sixth uh kind of or not a sixth but another one mana counter spell in spell snare and this is at the expense of uh preordain it looks like uh i'll have to list only play two preordain it's i would say the chain lightning usually is forked bolt and other lists and spell snare and pyroblast are usually brazen borrower and other lists sure Sure. So what I'm saying here is I believe just having more instants or sorceries that interact with your opponent's stuff is better than playing Brazen Borrower, which is a conditional instant or sorcery, but doesn't flip your Delver and also like costs two, then three, which is like kind of clunky. Also with uh, this focus on Delve, you want cards that actually go to the graveyard exactly. and just, yep. you know, exist in some other liminal zone somewhere. Um, so yeah, anything else on the main deck while we're still there? Um, you could also not play Uro. The first list I played of this deck, I played Hooting Mandrills instead of Uro. Then Stefan told me that playing Uro is better for a few reasons. I think if you get into the late game stage of the Delver Mirrors where no one has anything, and then it's just whoever draws a threat is going to be better off. Uro is one of the better ones because they're going to have to counter spell it so many times, and then they're just going to run out. Um, and I th- like playing exactly one because if you play two, it can clog your hand and it's kind of clunky. Yeah, I think having one in your deck just adds this whole new dimension where yep. when the game goes super long, you now have like a this big hammer you can build towards. Mm-hmm. Um, I think once you build around it much more than that, then you kind of exactly. go against what makes a deck so efficient and strong in the first place. But uh, yeah, it's a, a nice thing to have access to for sure. So yeah, uh, now to answer your question, this sideboard... This is not a sideboard I would register in a Grand Prix. Uh, this sideboard has some very specific plans in mind, and it's basically looking at the decks I wanted to play against. All right, so these submerges, first off, covers elves and the RUG mirrors. And I would probably, if there was something like Maverick in the event randomly, submerges an all star too. So, you know, kind of, that's a card you see in normal Delver sideboards, and I think it's pretty good here, so I'm not cutting it uh surgical soul guide lantern graph digger's cage sort of occupied somewhere spaces but i played a cage instead of the second soul guide because i kind of feel like having another card that's good versus elves was going to be useful in, in this event and getting overlap with like a sort of powerful one of like that i think is really useful that makes sense and a, a little more graveyard hate than we had in the past just because you know we have a known dredge player and two people who you know Hogak, one yeah. of whom always plays hogak yeah. yeah um so got to expect some amount of that uh any consideration for even more on that front or does this feel mm. like the right amount it felt like the right amount because the problem is like i'm going to be if you start cutting other ones you lose margins in the other places where i wanted to gain as well it's like it, it's really tight i sort of just tried to figure out how many cards i wanted for each matchup and built it that sort of way and like I don't think it was perfect. I don't think there is a perfect because that would involve me having literally perfect information. But I, I think this was close enough that made me feel good about the decisions that I made. Like Blazing Volley, Rough Tumble, EE were a nod to Elves 
and um death and taxes um i i kind of actually don't like rough tumble that much I, versus I, dnt because it's so volatile sometimes i i was about to say i know you've had choice words about rough tumble in the past but uh yeah the, the difference is when someone's when you are relatively sure one person's playing elves and like if someone shows up with sedmore sedgemore witch grixis delver that's a like that card is actually insanely good for a Sedgemore Witch, mm. based on how the cards line up. Because you want to kill the Witch, so Blazing Volley is not good enough. But Rough Tumble does kill the Witch and the Pest Tokens, so that's that's another reason I decided to play it. And I thought there was like a non-zero chance someone would do that sort of thing. It's also kind of a nice hedge against both variants of Elves that could show up, where they have at least one of you know Nettle Sentinel or Elvish Reclaimer. Yep. Both of which get around Blazing Volley, but both of which also die to uh, to Pyroblast. Um, is yeah. Elves the main reason for the Engineered Explosives as well? The other reason I wanted to play E's is I actually like it versus Red Prison because you can kill multiple Chalices with it. Oh, okay. That makes so, sense. So, if you look at the mapping for this deck, it's kind of awkward because you have Null Rod and E in your deck at the same time versus Death and Taxes. But at the same time, if you have a Null Rod out... I'm not sure you actually need to activate engineering explosives very often versus them. Um, obviously, there are cases where you're going to want to, but it, it's like a weird non-bow, but I think it's acceptable because Null Rod's pretty good versus Aether following the equipment mm -hmm. after that deck. A um, few more notes about the sideboard. I think Wilt you often see. Clothis you definitely see. The card that is missing that a lot of people play is Sylvan Library, and that's actually the card I cut last second for a second quote this. And I, I'll go into a brief di uh, digression about that, which is versus the control decks, Sylvan and Quothis are both relatively good, but Quothis is harder to kill. Um, obviously, if Sylvan's unchecked versus a control deck, you'll be more likely to find the, the one of Quothis. But the problem with Sylvan in a lot of the games versus control is they can sometimes just ignore it and just go over the top of you. Whereas Quothis actually starts like killing them and like being unremovable, you know? I do know, Jarvis. I do. Yeah, you do. And uh Life from the Loam is a card that I think is excellent in Dover Mirrors. Decent versus like a deck like lands. And like even fine versus DNT, if you get to cast it once targeting three lands before like they rest in peace you then it's good like obviously it's bad versus rest in peace but like so many of your cards are bad versus rest in peace versus from the dnt side that like i don't think you can really avoid it 100 percent. you can try to hedge for it a little bit or try to get a little bit of value before it comes down and then uh null rod so you know dnt but also we know there's a mystic force player good oh, yeah. to have the the, yeah, the nuclear true. weapon there and if someone decides to show up with like storm no rod is extremely good in that matchup too so you know i i think it's worth having one no rod i actually usually play no rod in my dover sideboards for that reason as well because i i hate counterspelling aether vial and getting aether out again it's like one of the most inferior things to happen in that matchup whereas Okay, Null Rod basically is Pithing Needle for all of their Aether Vials, but also if they're DNT, then you don't have to worry about GTA or like Sword of mm -hmm. Fire and Ice or whatever. I, I think I like Null Rod enough that I would basically always play one in my Delver sideboard until I stop playing this deck, probably. So, n knowing what you know now, if uh, you're with the, the field you expected, which to be fair was pretty close to the field that actually materialized. Um, would you go back and change anything if you, you ran the tournament against the same actual field? I would have one more card for Red Prison, I think. Um, and what, what would that be, do you reckon? I think I might just cut the Rough Tumble for a second, Engineer Explosives, but it's or cut a Blazing Volley for a second, Engineer Explosives. I think that's how I would do it, but obviously it's kind of close. It's hard to say for sure. Problem is Blazing Volley is not good versus most of the Red Prison decks, whereas EE is fine. And Rough Tumble is okay because it clears out all of their uh, X2s if you're playing against the Basuda version. If they're not playing against the Basuda version, I think Rough Tumble is a lot less appealing if they're just like 8 Planeswalker, you know. I don't really want Rough Tumble in my deck yeah. in that matchup because then like that's just a strategic mismatch. Mm -hmm. Alright, let's get into uh, the matches then. Yeah. So... Oh, that, that constructed rating, Jarvis. Yeah. 
I play a lot of uh, decks that are not very good, so then you lose a lot. I, I know the feeling. All right, so round one versus Utley. So I'm pretty sure they're white-red painter, and I use this... I, now that I've predicted the metagame, you might as well use it to inform your mulligan decisions. So, you know. So uh, on the draw versus painter... Obviously, they're like you might get turn one blood moon or some nonsense like that, but their last list only has one blood moon, and this hand's pretty damn good versus painter otherwise. So I think it's just like a snap keep. Yeah, I like it. And this looks this has the appearances of a painter opening, and I choose not to play anything there because I think it's just such a high likelihood I get blasted. Whereas, like, if I just leave a bolt or snare, I might be able to pick off their thing if they go for something is this turn. There, now that you have two fetches, is there any consideration to playing a fetch and passing, and then if they do have the Blood Moon on this turn, you get to fetch Island, and uh, it's going to be a struggle for sure, but you can at least cast spells and maybe participate in the game still? Yeah, I think that was an error, actually. Good thing you brought that okay, up. Okay, so yeah. turn one, game one, round one, Reva. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Forcible is an excellent draw, obviously, and... Now I think I'm okay playing a Delver out, obviously. What's the uh, the Lightning Bolt count in the stock list there? Their For deck? Them? Yeah. Zero main deck, four I sideboard. Guess, I guess they are the one who decides what stock in this case. But uh, Yeah, exactly. With, with that in mind, is there a case for just running out Tom Goyf? Uh I want to leave up Spell Snare and Bolt. Sure. Yeah. I think next turn I, I'll have... To, I, it, it's not about killing them quickly. It's about making sure you don't put the shields down, in my opinion. I don't think this one's worth forcing because, like, this is the card you really care about. And if you just force that and they just have a bunch of servants, then it doesn't really work out well for you. And now I get to play a beefy boy. He's thick. And that, that, it's that, that, that get I, even thicker. Yes. Yeah, I, I cannot, I could not spell a snare that fast enough, to be quite fair. So, here. I expected them to play the Servant, and then just play Candace first. I'm like, whoa, that's weird. I don't know. And so we, we intend to just untap and bolt that? I, well, do I even have to bolt it? That's the real question. You don't question. have to, yeah. yeah. It is kind of nice as well that they can now no longer use a Blast to defend their own spell from a Forcible. So. Yeah, that's, that's true. But I, I'm not even sure that... With them only having two cards in hand, do I really need to force that painter? I'm not sure. And so we we hold the land there, right? Is that just you you think um a potential brainstorm is more important than getting the extra counter on Hex Drinker right now? Yeah, I think so. I guess also if you let painter resolve, then you can just pitch it exactly. forward, which is kind of what? That, yeah. That's the other reason to do that. Although, now the land, weirdly, I cannot pitch the force anymore, so. But I, I still hold it, I think, because of the... Oh, no, I don't. So I think if you were doing this, it makes sense to hold it still, because yes, then it does. You, can, you can pitch out the force, but if there's no need to do that, you can still untap, play the land, and then sink all your mana into getting Hexdrinker to level 8. Yep. That's a mistake. I should not play the yeah. land this turn. Playing the land next turn obviously makes sense, but so I guess now that I've done this, I'm committed to leveling it this turn. But I think this is just kind of a kind of doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I think it's very unlikely to matter from this spot, but uh, you know, good to be safe with that stuff. I mean, it could matter if I guess here they had like painter blast grindstone or something, um, but they couldn't activate on the same turn, so you probably are in the clear still. Yeah. So the problem is I have to force this here because they can always defend their thing with blast because all of their things are artifacts. Yeah. So here's the question. If you hadn't if you had held the land, as we suggested, mm -hmm. are you pitching the land here to the force or are you pitching uh Uro bearing in mind that the land gets Hexdrinker to level eight on this following turn? I would I would pitch the Uro still. Okay. 
So I get blasted here, and I'm like, now I'm like kind of scared that I'm going to lose, because if they just have Grindstone, like, it's pretty bad for me. And I, I think leveling all the way makes sense, and now I'm just going to hope that, okay, if they have Grindstone, I'm going to force and hope they don't have a blast, you know. And, well, they had a one-turn window because this has protection from everything. They didn't have it. So, uh, there you go. Yeah, Easy. I think, uh, really putting his weight that game, for sure. Yeah. I don't think it was necessary, but, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, what more can you ask for a one drop there? So, versus Painter, I think this card is a huge liability. Yes. And this the, card the, the deck is... is just a whole stack of Pyroblast and Bolts, so, um... Interesting to see the uh, the explosives not make it in. Is it just too inefficient? Bearing in mind that you know it's not like you have zeros or ones that you really want to kill. I think that's part of it, and the other part of it is like um, their mana curve's kind of flat. It goes from like one to three pretty evenly. So I I'm not convinced that this is very good. And a lot of people asked about blasts uh, versus painter. I think the better painter. Players do not name blue in post board games, like especially versus a blue deck. So I think this would be an error for me to have in this in my deck versus them. Yeah. So let's see what happens. Well, this is a classic Dover hand, <laughs> and this is also a classic Dover hand where you you know you keep and you're like, well, it's exactly fine, right? <laughs> So I don't think you can ever force the welder here because, you know, especially with a bolt in your hand. And well, it I think some people would not play the Dover there, tr intending to just like force it with the first thing. And I'm like, my question to be to them would be, how are you going to win the game? Like you literally have no pressure, and they have infinite time to set up. Yeah, your hand is kind of unimpressive as it is, and I think yeah. you're more likely to win if you flip the Delver and then can draw out of your current predicament than if you mm -hmm. kind of just lose all your resources and then have to do that as well. Yep. Um, very nice that they have presented a juicy wasteland target, which you can't really take for granted against Painter all the time. Agreed. And now, now they have the Painter and Grindstone, scary. so I literally have to wasteland the city and just hope they don't have another soul land. And there's a Scalding Tarn off of my deck while I'm like, well, this is what we're going to do. But here's the other problem. If you bolt the Servant now, it doesn't really accomplish anything. Because they can just weld out the Grindstone or the Painter at some point. Especially with the trick, if they have a Soul Land, you can put the Grindstone activation on the stack, weld it out for the Painter in response. Yeah, or, or even they don't have to do that now, right? If you give them enough time, they yeah. just play a few more Mountains right. and, and get there, so... You kind of have to hold it, and the game enters this weird holding pattern where neither of you can really do anything. Well, so basically I have to kill the Goblin Molder first before killing the Painter, is the actual yeah. reality. And uh, they miss on a land this round. I'm like, oh, maybe I can sack out this game now. Spell Snare is, like, not the best, but at least I can start attacking, you know? The, the problem with Spell Snare is this is already here, you know? And classic racing situation. So Brainstorm's actually an excellent draw, but I don't want to play it immediately because it just lets them use their mana. You yeah. kind of want to get them to tap out, you know? Yeah, they're, they're choked on mana, so I think it makes sense to to wait here. So bearing in mind that you can force a will this, uh, this lightning bolt, just with anything, basically. Um, no, it's on white. Oh, it's on what they put it on what? I, okay. I told you, th yeah. this person only plays Painter. I know they're not going to do this in a post-board game. They're just going to name a different color. Sure. Okay, well, I, in that case, how much utility do you think the Spell Snare has right now? Not much, but you might as well cast Brainstorm first because they've tapped yeah. out of red. Yeah. And this is, like, pretty good, actually. So the question is, how do you want to play this turn? There's a lot of ways you can play the turn now. Yeah, I think so. We can set up a uh, bolt on welder, and then wilt on painter servant mm -hmm. to kind of get ourselves out of this thing. That said, we have to decide now if we want to defend our Delver. Um, 
it's awkward that we have like exactly three blue cards, but ideally we picture spells in there, one of the fetches would be a blue card and we could kind of have it all. Mm-hmm. Um, but instead, we do have to make a choice over whether we strand the force ball. I think that's kind of worth doing just because this Delver is a big threat. If they have, let's say, a Pyroblast to kill the Delver, that could probably find a good target anyway. Right. And if we don't have pressure, then it's going to be a lot harder to to really make any progress. And we have bought it out some of our threats like Forager, like Uro. So yep. we can't really count on finding those uh, reliably. So I do think I like finding the, the Bolt. And I guess then, is there a case of pitching the other force becomes a question. Um, like if the card you care about is another painter, then you'd rather just have Spellstone left over if you think card quality is going to be an issue, or quantity rather. Um, that said, if you draw another blue card to pair with the second force, then that's the artsy. You, you'd, mm-hmm. Maybe it's worth playing towards that outcome. Uh, so I guess my line would be put back at least a fetch, and then you ask is basic island better than like if I have to crack fetch on this turn to Volk and Bolt, then I don't have green for Wilt. So I guess I put back island as well. Um, Mm -hmm. It depends how many moons I I know is in a previous list. The answer was one blood moon and like like one magus of the moon. Okay, but with that in mind, then I think I just put back Island Fetch and then mm-hmm. uh, Force Pitching Spellsner. Yep. I think that makes most sense. I think I mess it up, but let's see. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So Force Pitching Force, okay. This is also defensible. I guess my reasoning was exactly what you said, which is you're not guaranteed to have another blue card, and maybe you need to cover a second painter, right? Mm hmm. And I, I think you have to force that bolt because I, if you just give them enough time with my hand versus their hand, I think I'm so likely to lose. Now, I think letting them untap does that change anything? Uh, it doesn't really, right? Because if right. Let's say they draw exactly Soul Land or you know Land Petal, which is what they need to combo. Then if they go for the combo, if you destroy Grindstone, then it's too late. If you destroy Welder, then they just weld out the Grindstone for the Servant. Yeah. Or Sorry, if you destroy Servant, they weld, weld out Grindstone for the Servant again. So they just get to do that. And you don't have enough mana to Bolt and Weld on this turn cycle. Yeah. Um, that being said, if you know you're going to have to kill the Welder to kind of unlock the will to do anything. Maybe you just bolt it now. Yeah, I think I just should have just bolted it then. Like there's there might be a weird scenario where they get like extra men off of it too or something. So I think here what I'm supposed to do is bolt the welder and spell snare that in response. Yes. Yeah. And you can get item now, so that's nice. Um well I so I actually fucked it well, up. Actually, no, you can't. You, you yeah. can't. Oh. <laughs> I was not supposed to fetch the island. Funny you bring that up because getting island is super bad, and like I think that would actually cost me a lot. Yeah, this is actually really awkward now. Too, if we don't draw the land, right? Because we can't cast all of our spells in one turn. Um, but now the spell snare is dead too. And now so the spell snare is dead. It's actually yeah. just super bad the way I did it, and. Uh, to be fair, I think I probably lose that lightning bolt, but that doesn't change the fact that that turn cycle was not well played. It it accidentally works out, and now you have a card left over for brainstorm, but that's a a small consolation there. It's a small consolation for this what looks to be very uh, oh. lethal blood moon, and I didn't like main phase brainstorm because of the blast issue again, but now. Now that we're here, I wish I had, but I, I didn't know that that was going to happen at that standpoint, you know? Yeah, of course. Now, now, now I think I'm mostly just dead in the water. I don't know, like, I would have to draw a Delver and then, like, flip a bunch of bolts. Forked Bolt doesn't do it here, sadly enough. I left in Forked Bolt because of Goblin Engineer and Goblin Boulder. I'm mostly dead now, I think. 
and and now I'm like super dead. What's the benefit of fetching there? Uh, to not draw the bad cards, right? And yet, and yet, I actually like surgical versus welder and engineer, generally speaking. Oh yeah, I think it's a fine card to board in. It's just kind of comical in the in the situation. I think at this point, I was actually debating casting it just to look at their deck. Then I realized that if I reveal it, it might set up a situation where they play around it with their welders and engineers where they might not otherwise. Yeah, I, I think you maybe give away more than you're gaining there. Yeah. So game three, that one I like. I think I was actually likely to lose despite the debacle, but it's not good to do what I did as well. Um. It looks I'd like you have one more back in. Yeah, yeah, one forger because I think threat density was my concern. Even though like it is clearly not good versus a lot of their cards, but the thing I realized that maybe they just have to blast and bolt so many things that you know maybe you can run them out. Uh, classic Delver hand can never keep. Classic Delver hand that you automatically keep. Uh, I kept both of my fetches because of uh, the whale. I don't think it's like worth dazing this. You don't even know that it's going to flip or not. So like the mana is more important on the next turn cycle, in my opinion. Yeah, and they have a lot of like twos and threes in their deck. So the, the daze is likely to be live at some point. Or they're going to go like uh, two drop plus power blast or something and you can find a good window. So spot um, the play. So, you can daze it, force them to pay one, and then just level hex drinker up to three, make it a four four. Yeah, which is still vulnerable to like bolt plus trader maker, but I think you're yep. fine with is that. Is it? Oh no, it's not. Okay, <laughs> so scratch that. Reverse yeah, it. so I think you just you you have to daze it because if you don't daze it, you don't just have no clock in them. Then it's so easy for them to get to like assemble their thing that kills you. You know. Yeah, Hex Drinker looking pretty phenomenal this match so far. Yeah, I just think Savannah Lions with upside of scaling into Progenis in the late game is so good. And here I decide that I don't think this matters. Yeah, results. Oh. That's fine. Uh, slight punt was, if I'd known this was going to be like this, I could have probably fetched an island with one of these fetches, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's it, it, That's definitely a mistake, and if it costs me, well, so be it. And look at that brainstorm I have. They're just blocking to save two damage. D do you think that they thought they could lightning bolt it? I mean, I thought for a moment you could lightning bolt it, so <laughs> could not fault them if they did. But uh, so, yeah. maybe. I, I think you have to force this every time, otherwise you're just dead next turn. Because you just you yeah, search for a painter servant. And then yeah, this is kind of mandatory, I think. Yeah. And obviously, I was likely to get blasted, but it's it's fine. And there is the painter servant. I top deck forked bolt <laughs> to prevent Lucky from dying. Goodness. And it's kind of funny because I didn't have an island to play. There's a lot less outs that I could draw. Like if I had the island to play, I could at least ponder looking for it. You know? Yeah, you get four more looks at it. Instead, like now I get to just basically put them in the abyss because now they're at. Uh, six, so any welder doesn't do it because they'll just have to block, right? Or they can't even block, they're just dead next turn. Yeah, they need painter mana salt on that turn specifically, so. Right. Yeah, so, I actually think uh, save the day. Yeah, uh, a nice easy one. Obviously, I did not play it great, but I think I won in deck selection, to be fair, because they just like. I don't think paint white red painter in this field of all of these like Delver decks is really necessarily the best deck to bring in my opinion, but you know, I, I could I be love, wrong there. I would love for that deck to be good, but I, I am yet to be convinced. So this is the person I think that is most likely to be on red prison because of their past results, but it wasn't like a high end. It was like maybe three, but this hand's just phenomenal versus everything. So it doesn't really matter. Right. Like this is like a another, almost uh, another classic Delver hand. This is like a perfect Delver hand, though, is the difference. Yeah, this is the other type of, uh, you know, uh, Delver draw. And then they play Misty. I'm like, oh, that's not Red Prison. That's the least Red Prison I've seen. And... So at this point, they, they play Misty, crack for basics, no island, play Ponder. 
what are you thinking? Omni until our bant. That's literally yeah, I, I, in that order, probably for me. Yeah, that, in that order for me as well. Although it, it's like a it's like fifty five forty five situation. I think uh, there's the hex drinker not flipping my delver, so boo hex drinker. But I finally land off my ponder, which I obviously I want. Is it automatic to ponder there over preordain? Because I think like so. if you find if you find a non uh like if your top three cards are like chop and then two bad cards are kind of priced into drawing one of the bad ones. I guess you can like preordain after that, so it's fine, but yeah. Um the, the sequencing there maybe is worth going into. Uh, I think you are supposed to ponder uh because oh well, first off, if you find fetch like bad instant or sorcery at least you can shuffle it away after revealing to delver right uh but i also think there are not many that many bad instant or sorceries i think most of the things that are strictly bad for you there are going to be like three creature piles right in which case like all right suppose you see three creatures well um under shuffles is more looks at a land versus preordain that only looks at three for a land you know yeah, I guess the other argument is, let's say you ponder into a land. At that point, you're planning on preordaining as well on that turn, like assuming the land is not wasteland or something. Well, and I, then you I, do... I didn't off the fetch because I wanted to flip, right? Right, this is what I'm saying is, if okay. the ideal end state is we get to play one cantrip, find a land, and then cast the other cantrip, if this exact situation comes up, we now don't really want to preordain because we want to keep the top of, top of our deck known for Delver. Whereas mm -hmm. if we preordain, we find a land and then we get to ponder, there's a higher chance that we get to uh, flip the Delver on the next turn while also, you know, using our mana efficiently. But... I see. So maybe I should have considered that. But I think this is more of a judgment call rather than strictly right or wrong. Because the other thing is, if you just fought out, like you will want to hang on to this for a little bit as well. The other thing. And also, it's like kind of nice to have it as a pitch card for Fawn, just in case of some weird shenanigans, right? I, I don't know. I, I, I guess it is closer. I didn't really think about it too much. It just felt like Pondering was correct. And here they just go to clean up after not shuffling off Pondering. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then they discard a Snow Island. I'm like, wait, they just F6 through their turn? Dom, what what can you, <laughs> is this where you say paid actors? Yes. <laughs> okay, As fair I enough. Say, I am not one of them, but if I were. Hey, hashtag paid actors. <laughs> oh my god, that was that so was... does uh does that being a second snow island tell you anything? And I guess does them just going to hand size tell you anything? Well, the the hand size thing is literally meaningless. Second island makes me think. I mean, tell a little bit more, but it's it's kind of it's kind of a coin flip, right? Still, because I mean, it, it shifts the odds in favor of them being a deck with a lower land count, right? Versus, I, I guess actually, all the candidate decks here, whether it's Food Chain, Bant, or Miracles, all have roughly the same land count in the end, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of nineteen versus twenty. So here, this is interesting. What you're supposed to do. You could put a daze in your hand and then play Hex Drinker with the plan of drawing Delver next turn. I don't think you should shuffle this because I think once they F6 through their second land drop, the second daze is going to be like backbreakingly good. Yeah, I think I want to draw Delver and play it and pass with the idea that if that is going to hand size and they are a combo deck, it's kind of hard for even something like Omnitel to have the nuts from that position, right? They mm -hmm. would need to have either Soland or Petal, plus another mana source in that case, mm -hmm. plus show omniscience, payoff, and then two ways to fight through your know, force plus days. That's their entire hand, basically. Um, and right. that's assuming it's exactly Omnicell and they have it all rolled up um, versus your deck like Food Chain, which literally cannot go off in that position. Or uh, So, I, right. yeah, I think I like taking the line which only loses to the absolute top of their range, but is better in basically every other scenario. Because what I do want to minimize as well is if this is somehow a you know, miracle control deck, hand, yeah. just got mana screwed, yeah. I don't want them to have time to really set up a terminus or something effectively. Um, so, Ooh. yeah. Looks like Pass Me agrees with you. 
It's because the Hex Drinker is like actually slower clock because like three damage increments are better than two. Plus this opens up the possibility of drawing a lightning bolt for the last, like the literal quicker turn, right? And and this way you get to even just cast Tarmogoyf next time if you want to. Yeah. Obviously not dazing that because... And uh, yeah, they just concede. I believe when I actually played this match, we can't look at the chat anymore. They said sorry, and I'm like, that's weird. Why would they say sorry to me when they're the one who missed their second <laughs> land drop? I gotta feel bad for them now that they've said sorry. But uh, obviously, it's it's a tournament, you know. If you click through that, it's you gotta just live with your mistakes. So by this point, I'm just like, I think they're Bant or Omnitel, but I hedge for a little bit of both by siding in Clothis. I normally would not side in Clothis versus Omnitel. I don't think it's very good. Yeah, for sure. But, the the reason I say I'm hedging is I take out a wasteland, a goif, and a bolt, a few bolts, a chain, and a forked bolt. But I don't think the bolts are actually good versus Omnitel or Bant. Really, like, uh, I don't. Sometimes you can shave a turn off, but I think what actually happens in those matchups is if you interact with them while having a lower land count, you tend to win because you don't float out as often. Is what generally happens. But yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, so. And, and yeah, to... both decks kind of built to be mostly safe against Wasteland. Exactly. It is kind of weird that I'm siding in two Clothis, which are both three drops and siding out a land, but I'm also on the draw, so it's I think it's pretty safe. And uh, this is not a perfect Delver hand. In fact, this <laughs> is the opposite of a perfect Delver hand, but uh, knowing what we know from game one, I think you're actually supposed to keep... Yes. On the draw, especially if they do turn out to be Bant Control. If they turn out to be Omni, this hand's like kind of awful, actually. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know. Well, so there is a chance that if they're Omni, you get to do the, the trick of like, put Uro in, respond to the trigger, uh, or you get one trigger, you draw a card, see if you can make a land drop, and then respond to the other trigger by voting that Omni. Um, which, I guess if they have like nothing else, can, can save you a game there. Anyways, yeah, we we just start pricing to keeping, I think, which is surgical is interesting because it's like simultaneously not that great, but also might be backbreakingly good in a weird sort of way. All right, Dom, you ready for this? Tundra is like, OK, now I regret wasting setting out a wasteland, but, you know, it is what it is, right? Eh, I mean, th there are builds of miracles that have like exactly one uh wasteable land for that position right or i guess two if they have if they're banned and they have a trap chris picola says i'm surprised you brought in both clothes i actually like cloth is quite a bit versus the uro control decks i think it's one of the cards that's best versus uro because you don't really have a good window to deploy it replay function is trying to go oh above. do you have to yeah we had this last time right do I have to restart the client? I don't Hopefully think not. so. I'll just restart the replay. This is like super niche. Is there a case for fetching uh, Volk there instead? Just because like at the point where you're casting either Clothis or Uro, you're likely to have found a trap at that point anyway. And if you draw exactly Pyro, then hmm. that, that could be relevant if it is, you know, Omni or something. So Chris asks, we don't know what they're playing, but I narrowed their range based on other tournament results that they had, which was before Asteroid got banned, they played a lot of Uro control decks. So it's not completely blind. It might look like it's completely blind, but scouting and looking at their previous history matters a lot. Uh, yeah, maybe fetching Volk is better. That that turn got messed up. I reveal Brainstorm, which is actually excellent. Um, I would I would obviously much rather reveal Brainstorm than not. Obviously, that's not a perfect Brainstorm, but I found a land, which is super important. Now the question is, which of these cards do I want to potentially shuffle away with this ponder, which I think I do. 
Okay, so my thought would be in the face of you know tundra source of power shares, unless they have something like back to basics or yeah. they could be banned with Sylvan Library, then the will likely is not doing all that much for mm. us. And I think we should consider if we're going to have time to deploy both of these Delve threats. Um, Agreed. And if so, which one is better? I actually uh, think on this board, the Forager is much likely to be better. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I kind of like that. So we put back Wilt, Uro, and then uh, Cast Ponder. Yeah. Yep. And the Wasteland makes things interesting. I think I probably keep this Ponder now. Uh, which is kind of awkward in some ways, but also I think is going to work out exactly fine. Is that with the intention of using Wasteland, or are we just using that to cast all of our, our many three Well, drops? if you waste their thing, you can still cast a Forager off of it anyways, right? That's true, yeah. Are we are we thinking we want to Surgical Swords to set up a line where Forager is going to be much harder to answer? I think I end up doing this to see if it's safe to cast the Forager. Funnily enough, if that makes sense. Yeah. But now the jig is up. This tells you everything you need to know about the matchup. There's literally only one deck in Legacy plays this card, and it's Food Chain. Huh. So, so now... Hmm. The question is, do you fawn this or not, is the question. So I kind of think you do, because this hand, as it's set up right now, is actually... You know, poison maybe struggle against just a parade of three threes. Right. Um, and if we fawn this, then food train isn't doing much in the short term. You know, it's going to be quite hard for them to combo. And I'm not sure what else beyond combo pieces they could have that we would want to fawn, other than I guess like to fairy time raveler. Well, can't you do better just by looking at their hand, deciding if you wanted to fawn it or not? Oh, sure, we can, and yeah. And the plow is appealing to kill as well, which is the other part of yeah. it. Yeah, since we have the surgical, we may as well do that. I think in the dark, if we didn't have that, we would still want to fawn this anyway. Yeah. But yeah, since we have the surgical, obviously, just lead on this uh, yeah. first. Because if their hand is somehow a bunch of manipulate fates, I don't really feel like I want to fawn it. Oh, okay. Uh, it does go slowly. So this is their hand. It's not very good, honestly. Like... I think I feel pretty good about my chances this game now. Yeah, I mean, it's not very good. I, well, actually, I don't know about that. Like, let's say if you let this manipulate for it resolve, right, then they get three griffins in exile. And then if they draw a blue card, they're kind of off to the races. Well, um, why don't you just fawn the fate and then just reduce it to them right. having to draw a food chain and one of the things yeah, so... and for me not to draw anything. Yeah, so seeing this hand, I think, yeah, the, the case for Fawn is even stronger. Because also if you Fawn that, you get to rebuy it with Forger fairly quickly as well. And also just maybe even hardcast the Force Negation once you do that, right? Like, that, the, that is one of the good things about that. So I, you have to pitch Brainstorm, which kind of sucks, but I, I think it's not the end of the world. And you get to waste their White Source, which cuts off Ranger Captain Vios, which is actually one of the scariest cards in the matchup. But you wasted their green sauce. Well, the, I guess my reason was I know they have a food chain, <laughs> right? But they also have a fetch. Sure. So I think maybe I should have built the Tundra. Yeah, because they can get out yeah. of that situation either way. I guess one argument could be you could set up a line where you surgical a dual land that you've wasted, but I guess they can just fetch the other one in advance. Have, no matter what, so. That deck usually plays Savannah as well, so that doesn't really work. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think the reason I should have killed the uh, the the White Source was Ranger Captain, to be quite fair. Because Ranger Captain is terrifying. Like, I... I, am I oh, and we just... No, but... Okay, <laughs> well, I mean, we so knew actually, that, we yeah. knew the what was there, so I guess this worked out, you know? I'd forgotten I had brainstormed it back, but now I'm just like, <laughs> wait, everything's working out. Now I put the fawn in my hand, like, I'm feeling pretty good about this game now. Brainstorm, obviously, an excellent draw for them. Uh, what's their is hand? It it's so like... excellent that you want to fawn it? I, yeah. yeah. I think so. But then they have another one, I'm like, Just... okay, well, okay. that's fine. You know. 
and they play a second forest, and I'm like, that's how good is that? Oh, interesting. You know, we only left in three wastelands. <laughs> oh, but I think this is a good turn to deploy Clothis because I know they're not going to go off soon. Um, because we we've basically seen their hand. That's kind of annoying, but it's like whatever. I I think the Clothis will easily kill them before they assemble their combo. And that's not the scariest Ballista I've ever seen. And also, for those of you who don't know, Uchain only lets you make mana to cast creature spells. You can't activate creature abilities with it. With that in mind, I wonder if it's actually a mistake for them to hold the... Uh, or, or to play out the Ballista there. I think it might be, actually. Because they're so far away from comboing, sure, but if they do get the combo, that actually is a viable route to win the game now, whereas... Shit. Yeah, the, there's just... The, the replay fast-forwarded. I ended up searching okay. their food chain because my reasoning was, I think Quothis races all of their anemic yes. beatdown draws. If you and... just remove the combo element, then they can never win. I think it might actually be like a mathematical lock, right? Where yeah. they, I guess if uh, once you surgical them, you can see if they have to ferry or not, which could be the way they contain it. But yeah, otherwise it is just guaranteed to kill them before they can uh, get you. They did not have to ferry in their deck, if I recall correctly, which is weird. I think if I were playing that deck, I would definitely play to ferry because it's one of the reasons to play that deck, in my opinion. One of the reasons to play white, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Stefan and I actually played uh, quite a bit of Teamer um, because we thought Imperial Recruit and Squee were really good. And also Pyro Blast Post were just so insane in so many matchups, you know? Mm -hmm. hmm, the replay feature is kind of bugging out nowadays. Kind of annoys me. Uh, found a land, but I think those other cards were bad, so I just shuffled anyways. I can't and then we don't preordain because I obviously we want to hold up snare, but what are we yeah. thinking we might be able to snare? Ice Fang? Do we care about that at this point? I mean, maybe not. We also saw their entire deck, so I don't think anything matters. Yeah. I just didn't know if yeah, uh, digging aggressively for force might be a wiser move. I think I'm going to call this one. I think I remember them just dying to this in like Fortune. It's not very interesting yeah. anymore. Yeah. Oh, and the force like kind of locks it up with the days underneath. So, um, I'm gonna restart MTGO because maybe the the replay thing will be fixed if I restart the client. I'm a professional MTGO player. With a a 1740 rating, Jarvis. Come on. Yo, look at that limited, bro. I've been I've been attacking the strict save and cues hard. Are you attacking a lot in the strict saving queues though, or are you playing these, you know, teamery grindy piles? There's a team or tempo version of that deck with sure. just blue green blood of age, which I think is actually quite good. It's actually I prefer drafting that deck to the ramp deck because the ramp deck is like kind of you do the same thing literally every game. It play, every game plays out literally the same. It's not I don't know. It's not combo. It's not combaty enough for me. Uh, so we ended up playing that one. All right, round three is versus Patsy, and uh, I guess you get to see the result. But so by this point, my friend had played versus them yesterday in the queues and said they were lands. So I just assumed they were lands, which might come back to haunt me. Um, well, so this hand's pretty good versus lands and not very good versus almost anything else. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's actually it's, fine in a Dover Mirror as well, even though this is dead because you have two wastelands and a bunch of lands. But you know, I think it's on the low end of hands, and certainly if they're not lands or Delver, this hand's like atrocious. So you know, kind of a calculated risk, but uh, end up keeping it. I the reason I gave for it, you know them all, and. Or when they go once upon a time, I'm like, uh oh, this is not good. And when they were real visionary, I'm like, wow, this is quite bad for me now. Now I'm basically just a lock to lose this game unless I get very lucky. 
Bloody Strand was the top deck, which is obviously not ideal because A, I drew another <laughs> land, B, I don't have a way to like really enact a meaningful game plan. But other than that, it seems like a fine draw, right? Julian, I gave my reasoning. I don't think it's indefensible if you think they're lands or Delver to keep that hand. Even if they are Delver, uh, is there a case for like you, your average six probably is is better there? I don't think so. The, the double wasteland thing and a bunch of lands means you're invulnerable to their wastes, I think is quite quite a thing. Prop being revealed, not good. All right. So, you know. Most we have something, but I'm so likely to lose on there. And here's a glimpse. I'm like, okay, well. All right. I'll probably just fast forward to the end of this. Well, we could just, yeah, get out, get rid of this game. Okay. Do you believe I'm going to lose with three glimpses active? I or do. They have another creature. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm out. Peace. Peace from this game. All right. The one nice thing is, well, so I had out a Pyroblast. I don't think Hex Drinker is very good. I think this is one matchup where Hex Drinker is not that good because it's, it being Savannah Lines is quite bad. It takes way too long to level it up into a real threat. I also don't think Uro, On, or the Pyroblast are good. And I cited in Cage, Rough Tumble, Blazing Volley, Submerge, Submerge. All sounds fine to me. Yeah, I, you can maybe make a case for Uro as like. A threat that can mm. snowball by itself, but I, I'm skeptical. By the time it snowballs, they're fucking killing you with their green sun zenith and natural orders. <laughs> it, it does find you defensive tools against those in a way that other threats don't, but yeah, I, I still don't like it on balance. And On the other hand, this hand's excellent in the matchup because this is basically everything you want to do. Yeah. Can still get bodied by Anasaur Shepard, but... Uh... Look, why no, would you even say that? Anything. But why would you just say that? It's so rude. How do you feel about Cheaty Face, uh, Dry Darber? No, a fan. Should be illegal. So, I found two Wastelands. I think actually wasting them is really good here. Agreed. Instead of, uh, you know, trying to play... Uh, Delver and do nothing. So now I really need a bolt. So you basically just have to brainstorm. And there's a bolt. I think the wasteland... No, maybe the waste is still good. Oh no, the waste is not great for scoring Ranger. The issue. Now the other question is, are you going to cut yourself off from green this game? Have you put the Volk back? Mm. Julian, you can check the deck on Cardboard Live. I update always. So I guess the question is, well, what would you do here, Dom? I guess the actual question is, do we need to train lightning this turn? Um, oh, I think so, you do. Yeah. Well, they, okay, so they have three cards in hand. We could open ourselves up to some like Gaia's Cradle into either Glimpse or Natural Order sequence. That being said, I kind of want to take the high variance line of um, put two cards back, play Lamb, play Delver, and then next turn we flip Delver, Chain Lightning the Shepherd, play Tarmogoyf, and then we have Force Up. Um, or we could, instead of playing Tarmogoyf, we could waste them if they like expose a Cradle or something without doing much else. I see. So if they don't give you that turn, that sets you up for a huge, massive swing next turn. Yeah, it's like, it, right. so let's say we don't do that. Um, we we play Volk, we train out in their thing. At that point, next turn, it's going to take at least another turn cycle to get the second Delver online. Um, we can play the Tarmogoyf, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of want to go aggressive here. But yeah, I kind of felt like the risk was too high, so I didn't do that because yeah. like if I mean, it, it, the problem is if you do that and they just have cradle natural order for progenus, you're basically dead on the spot. Yeah, so. I, I I do also think there's a case that um, they only have three cards left. 
if you shoot the shepherd, they're on such low resources. Exactly. That, yeah. You know, the the force uh, the force is likely to be good, and you're likely to have time to use it effectively. Yep. Um, so I think I think it's uh, let's say waste delta on top, play land, chain lightning, shepherd, attack for three. But I put Volk and Tarmogoyf back on top, with the reasoning being I'm going to just be a straight blue-red deck and I don't want to waste time drawing those. Maybe that's wrong? I'm not sure. I mean, I don't hate that, because you then know that you're not drawing a dead card next turn, or at least not a, a known dead card. This made me sad. It's you have a blue card for Shepard, or you have a blue card for Force, and you have a Brainstorm left. Yeah, but now I'm very so sad. They're glimpsing with one card, so I'm like, okay, I'm probably okay. Unless it's Heritage Druid, and yeah, I, we see how this all collapses now. Well, if they ever hit a land in this sequence, I'm fine. You know? Boy, or they actually That's... just draw with the best possible, I think. <laughs> They're like, this is the opposite of fine, you know? Yeah, this is so gross. Like, they literally only had one card. Are they Zenith for Visionary? I think you should just Zenith for Symbiote right there. Except, I guess, maybe they wanted to use Symbiote to return the Visionary. So, maybe that's what they were thinking. And they haven't used the Symbiote this turn yet? Yeah, they haven't. So, I guess that's what was going on, but... Do they have spare mana? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, they get the third thing, so... they pick it up. But they then they have to leave up... Visionary in play. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think you were supposed to just get a Symbiote instead. Eh, whatever. I I'm probably Julian dead. makes a good point as well, that like you might be looking for specifically Blazing Volley, Rough Tumble, Cage. Um, yeah. yeah. How much is Tarmogoyf actually going to do against their good draws from this spot? I actually think Tarmogoyf is not that good versus Elves, except when you draw a Sweeper anyways. So like... Uh... But now they have a second glimpse, and I'm like, all right, whatever. I, I end up losing from here. It's not that surprising, to be fair. Yeah. I actually think, after looking at the list that they played, they probably sideboarded zero cards versus me, which is reasonable. Maybe the yeah, version I, is, but... You, you really don't want to over-sideboard with elves, in my experience. All right, so that's round three. Um, Obviously, you got smashed, but, you know, sometimes it happens. Game one was kind of bad. Game two, I think, was close, but, you know... Sometimes you know, they have the second shepherd. Like literally, if they had that minus shepherd, I just force a glimpse and everything's fine, right? But you know, they had shepherd. So zero for Kone, I expected them to be a Delver mirror, but they also I know their range is wide. I think this hand's fine. It's not great. You're actually super exposed to them wasting your blue source. But let's see what they do. I, I don't think you can ever mulligan this hand. But now that they have Vista, well, I think my trap is safe versus Vista like 99% of the time. Do you go with that? Yeah. How do you feel about these Time Spiral Remastered Ponders? Uh, see, initially I didn't like them because I preferred the, the low end Mofo card, mm -hmm. but I think I'm actually coming around to them. I like Laura and Merfolk Art, but I don't mind the other one as well. So, uh, just play my Delver out. I don't know ex exactly what deck they are. They could be Banter Omni Tell again. Another Wasteland is not, <laughs> really not what I'm in the market for here. <laughs> uh, but those cards are pretty good, so. Yeah, and I do like taking days over force there, knowing that they can't actually combo in a day safe way mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. And also losing your brainstorm here is kind of bad because you know you're going to be drawing some clunkers for the next few turns anyway. Um, and you kind of like to you know, put back that third wasteland or one of the bolts maybe. So. And now, now all secrets is... are oh, revealed. Fine. This is literally just Omnitel, and I'm just like, oh my god. <sighs> So I think you're supposed to force pitch brainstorm, if I had to guess. But this ends up really bad for you a lot of the time. Uh, 
I actually like dating this, I think. Oh, and just giving them the card? You give them a card, but losing your yeah. force, like, the force is your best card, right? Like, right. if you lose the force, you're losing either the date itself or a brainstorm anyway, and at that point, it's, like, it's the one day is going to be them when you have no other pressure, you can't wasteland them. Mm -hmm. Like, if they are show and tell, then if they just draw another land at any point, then they get to show through your days anyway. So, yeah, I think Okay, so, I think I should days. I wonder what I do. Oh, I figured that out at the time. I guess I just forgot. <laughs> Look, it's really hard to remember what I did. It, it was literally yesterday. Uh, I, I guess that's kind of embarrassing that I forgot. And obviously they pay, but you they you basically let them cycle at the cost of... Well, and here's a really good sign. Now I know they don't have show and toe in their hand. Or they're missing the other part, because when they just cast it with the veil protected... Yeah, you're actually kind of in the clear now. Yeah, because this is a loud signal that they do not... They're missing something. I'm not sure what they're missing, but they're missing something. If I had to guess, they're either maybe flooded on veils and they want to be able to cycle one at a point where they right. might not have the mana to do so later, or... Yeah, yeah okay, so oh. yeah, second veil makes a ton of sense. So actually brainstorm looking for basically three blue cards essentially because I don't it's like kind of hard to improve but I think just forcing that doesn't do anything you know it, is there an argument for just not doing anything I guess there is maybe I should have just considered like, doing nothing but if you think about the odds of getting it would have to be like another force and two blue cards and then. So another force, two blue cards. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. I kind of want to just let it happen. Yeah, I probably should have done that. Obviously, it's too late now, but like, th th there is also a chance mm -hmm. that uh, the hand is like just a bunch of veils and a bunch of omnis or something. They're missing the show, and this That's is why. Oh, oh, Eureka! Jesus. So they were. <laughs> Uh, it, the reason they didn't last turn was they were missing the third green source essentially sure, or the, sure. the fourth mana source really so and i'm like oh that's bad i'm like oh gristle brand's actually unbeatable for this deck uh so i'm basically dead now because any competent omni tail player just attacks with gristle brand three times and you can never win so i kind of just see if i can bluff attack let's them. find out if they are a competent omni tail player maybe this is bad maybe i should have just bluffed them but now, now I'm just playing to double bolt it and hope that you know it works out. Obviously, it's probably not going to. But they just let it die, which is also a bad sign. But you know, okay, I think I fucked it when I brainstormed in response to the veil because maybe they didn't have it. You know. And this is kind of why I think Omnitel is a tough match. Also, note three forest, three islands. Yeah, that's 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 wild. a lot. I, so I think Wasteland's super bad versus them. Maybe you need that density of forest to support Eureka. Although, is this like a Eureka heavy list, or is this you know one Eureka to go with? One Eureka usually. You really can't play more than one one of that card because it's so clunky. I don't know if I like that. So, obviously dead here, and uh, let's just go to the next game. Alright, this hand is quite good in the matchup, so obviously I'm keeping. But, like, they're not a turn one deck, obviously it's like scary, but you still have days as well. Uh, I mean, Delver's basically your, just your best threat, so... Basically priced into keeping. Put on one to six... And, uh, you know, feeling good about this one. For a second, I thought that was an Ancient Tomb when I think I first played. <laughs> I just, like, I, I, I cannot remember which one of those those are, you know? Yeah, I, I really miss the days. I mean, I don't miss the days, but I remember the days of coverage when 
every week, you know, Senator Compatrick would just be going off about these <laughs> indistinguishable expeditions that were flooding the uh, the board all the time. I feel like people have kind of gone off of those now, though. All right. So here I actually put the Pyro into my hand and shuffle away the other cards and play Delver because I think it's safe to play Delver this turn, but it won't be safe on the other turns. I like it. Even though it doesn't mean I get to guarantee flip my Delvers, but I think that's fine. So here, if they're not careful, you might be able to get to day something, you know. And I think you do have to leave the Fawn on top of your deck for one turn cycle just to, you know, be safe. Notice how they fetched before playing their cantrip. They just fetch with both because they know about the trick. Did you notice that? What's that? They just cracked both of their oh, fetches. To, yeah, to, to waste in that days. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how you know that they play a lot of legacy. I think. I probably would have like actually done that too if they had given me the option. But well, maybe not. I don't know. Days is like pretty good. No, recently. I. I think when you have the hard cast force on top as well, like yeah. you have force but no blue card, you want to be able to cast that with... Because like right now, we have three layers of protection, essentially. And that's uh, with a two-turn clock, and that's kind of a nice spot to be in. So they exhale Spirit Guide, and I'm like, Spirit Guide's unusual in this deck. I don't see it very often. Yeah, again, it's another choice which makes more sense if you are leaning harder on Eureka, but... And they get Echoing Truth. I'm like, oh, that's... Because they just want time. And they play Veil, I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just... I guess I fawn it? Again, it, that seems like a good spot for a daze. Well, the thing is, if I just know they have Echoing Truth, right? Yeah, I mean... The th other thing is, I wonder if I actually care about this Echoing Truth. I think I decided I don't, so fawning it is fine. But if I daze it, then they just pay and then play Echoing Truth, and it doesn't sure, really sure. work. So that's why I, I think dazing okay. here is actually yeah. not good. Yeah, maybe you have to like let everything happen or nothing happen. Yeah. I, I just let that happen, and well, I that, just, okay. I, yeah. I, I, I'm just going to replay these Delvers. I think this is actually safer, especially now that I drew a Ponder. That was actually excellent. And uh, another Pyro is, like, pretty good. Obviously, the problem with Pyro is it's actually not very good versus Veil. Because if you just lead on Veil, then your Pyros don't do anything. Right. But I decide to leave up both Pyros because I think it's safer, and I don't think it changes the clock. Uh, I think Well, actually, it does change the clock, but you're trading a turn for one less Pyro being up, right? So basically, let's say you play the second Delva, and then you have to... Crack fetch to to pyroblast. At that point, you don't have the bot on top anymore. So it's you attack for six, and then you attack for six again the following turn. Versus, um, you know, you pyroblast without cracking. You draw bolt. You attack. That's three, and then the next attack is uh, three plus three again. So it doesn't change the clock. Um, on the other hand, I think it's kind of unlikely they can kill you from this spot. Mm -hmm. So. I think I like your line, actually. I guess the one thing to be aware of is, like, Coaddle, but you have double Pyroblast to hedge against that, so... I th I think either is fine, but, like, this is probably a little bit safer. Carpet is interesting, because, like, one thing you can actually do versus Carpet is just waste yourself. Or daze it, and make them pay, which also removes the mana. Do I waste myself? I don't. It's kind of close, actually, if I'm supposed to waste myself or not, I think. And look, every turn they've been playing so carefully, you've noticed that? They've always played around the waste days thing. And Pyro doesn't, it just goes down without a fight. So I flip the bolt. Do I shuffle it away? I don't. I wonder about that. Maybe I should have shuffled away that bolt. I think I like not shuffling there because um, once that pyroblast on that shamatar goes through, yeah, they they obviously don't have like a veil that turn or anything. 
at least I assume. Um, and then it seems like the second Pyroblast is probably going to be good again. And with mm-hmm. they'll have three cards after they draw. It's going to be hard for that to be show and tell something relevant to put in and a protection card. And so I like just like cutting a turn off the clock and stopping, you know, some weird like brainstorm into the nuts uh, sequence the following turn. Um, Andre Klepp is asking what I meant about wasting. You can respond to the carpet trigger by wasting one of your islands to reduce their mana count by one. I think I actually end up doing this in the next game. And you can wait for the trigger to go into stack to give them less information. Like if they decide to brainstorm a response, you can let the brainstorm resolve then waste and like... It's it's a small thing, but the small things add up in Legacy. And obviously dazing to return an island to prevent mana from carpet as well is obviously a thing that I just did right there. Uh yeah, I I think um I think what you said is correct, so Oh, that that's the other thing, yes. Uh sorry. Yeah, that that actually is what Oh, I actually on the next turn I do waste my trough to prevent a mana. Which is kind of like, because, like, look at my hand. I don't need that green mana for yeah. anything. Yeah, that's cute. Wasteland does a lot of, like, small things that are kind of not that easy to figure out. They shuffle with Ponder, and now I think they're mostly dead. And they just veiled to check me this time. But, well, fortunately, this time I can't trick myself by casting a blue card. Joke's on you. I have nothing. Well, I don't have nothing. I just don't have anything that lets them draw a card. So we go over to game three. And well, I mean, this is a Delver hand, you know. <laughs> I I, I, I really Delver. can't I, I can't say it any better than that, right? So, thought about dazing it, but the problem with dazing it in these spots is their deck is so. How should I put it? Or I guess, what am I trying to say? I don't know. What I'm saying is, I think <laughs> I think Days is generally pretty good versus them, especially in game one, because of they have to resolve like a three or four mana spell, but maybe I should Days here to prevent them from finding carpet or like veils or shit. I don't, I don't know. My instinct is that their deck tends to need so many like discrete pieces that... Brainstorm is one of their better ways of assembling that. Mm. Um, and like even if they have a combo already, then Brainstorm lets them dig aggressively for Veil or, mm. or Force to protect it. So, Or let's say, like, like whatever the deficiency in their hand is, Brainstorm is one of the better cards at correcting that most of the time. Um, and so I think Dazing here is actually pretty good, especially when you do have the turn one threat to, to back it up. And the other thing is, which is more subtle, I don't have a follow-up threat that costs two directly. Right. Where that would normally be the reason you don't daze, because yeah. you want to play your time wave a turn faster. But I don't even have that lined up. So your, your next sh- turn yeah. is likely to be just land ponder anyway, and so you still get to do that. Yeah. So I didn't daze here, but I think I should have. I think I actually should have. I hate dazing this one a lot more though, but maybe I should still. Well, so the the thing is, right, is. They cast Brainstorm, they put two cards back. So let's see what happened in this game. They cast Ponder, they didn't shuffle, they drew a card. Mm -hmm. Next turn, they cast Brainstorm without playing a land first. Mm -hmm. Which you would think if they both had the land and also were quite reliant on the Brainstorm resolving, then they would make the obvious play of hedging against Days by playing the land first. Um, So it makes you wonder if they had like all of these cantrips, but maybe no fetch. And so the plan with this preordain is this is my fetch land, effectively. This is clear the top of my deck, draw a card, and maybe if you daze them, you actually do get to brainstorm lock them or make them spin their tires a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think we should have dazed the brainstorm, but once we don't daze the brainstorm and they just go island preordain, I think I kind of like dazing the preordain. I, I don't know. I, I think so too. And yeah, DMK, I think they're almost a lock to bottom these two here. I think if it's basically going to happen and yeah i think i end up not dazing and i kind of regret that i kind of regret not dazing into brainstorm or the preordain i i do get the appeal of having this 
this wall of interaction where you have like force and blue card, double days, and possibly surgical. But um, so, now I'm pressed into pondering. And this is kind of weird. This is like the most unexciting ponder that I am probably forced to keep. Yes. Is how I would literally describe this. Do you agree with that description? Completely, yeah. And I think I'm supposed to draw a land this turn. I think you're meant to draw days this turn. Well, why is that? I only have one land in play. So the, the reason do? I have days is to have double force, double blue card plus days, right? I, I'm thinking about like, how are you using your mana? Because it's kind of scripted over the next few turns, right? Where right. you're drawing a card and then even if you cycled Wilt, you're drawing another known card, which you know is not going to do anything for you. So that mana's not actually going anywhere. So the one thing you maybe want to hedge against is if they have like the mortal nuts on this turn and you do need the third piece of protection to, to get through that. I see. I think you're right. I think I goofed it there. My Obviously, like my tunnel visioning was like, okay, what if I just get to daze twice this turn instead and have force behind? Sure. Maybe, actually, maybe it's not completely actually, a mistake. No, that, that, that does work then. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, no. What am, I, what am I saying? Um, yeah. Yeah. Why do we have to keep that? Because it's disastrous if you don't find another land, and the days and land are good enough that you have to keep. Because we already have the threat. So, like, the answer now is... Okay, so I actually thought quite a bit about this. I'm like, well, if they have literally... Uh, Spirit Guide plus Show plus Big Creature, I lose, but I can mostly untap and just wilt this. And it's kind of nice. Yeah, I, I like letting this resolve and then trying to wilt. They also played their land for turn, so I think it's relatively safe. Oh, I end up surgically until see if it's safe. Okay. Yeah. I always, I actually do this way more <laughs> than other people, I it. think. Yeah. It, it's so funny. Yeah, I, I, I usually just do this pretty often. You've you've noticed that I guess now about me, right? I just use surgical as like peak, like ninety nine percent of the time instead of like you know. What I've noticed is that you do that and then forget about it when we do these replays. <laughs> it always, I like, do. Takes surprise, yeah. Well, no, I, I I mentioned it last time versus the food chain person, and obviously now I know I can let this resolve and just happen. Well, I'm actually like wondering if they're supposed to veil. Just to draw a card this Well the the veils are kind of terrifying, I guess, so probably not. But now the real issue is what's going to happen is those veils are going to be super annoying the entire game, right? I can't force the brainstorm because if if I force a brainstorm yeah. they just they veil I can daze veil, they maybe veil again, I can daze again, and then they pay, and then I'm like totally wrecked. So I just have to let most things resolve, I think. Kind of sucks, but. And now they're digging really hard. Also, actually, when I looked through their deck, they had no Ice Fangs or Uros in their deck, and I thought that was really weird. Yeah, I guess this is. It's like a super a combo y but... version with a lot more yeah. mana. But I think cutting Coado and Uro actually makes you worse in this matchup. That makes sense. I I kind of agree for the most part, but I think Coado... I, I just don't know if it's actually that good on balance, but, like, it's very easy for that to get, like, dazed or bolted out of the way. Like, it makes Bolt into a somewhat relevant card in game one, and, like, if you're just buying time, that doesn't do anything for you unless it progresses you towards a state where you can combo. Um... Whereas, uh, at least with Uro, like, if Uro gets onto the battlefield, then, you know, you're going to be pretty far ahead. Whereas Corral is just a lot of spinning your tires in a deck that already does too much of that. Well, the other thing is, by cutting Uro from your deck, these carpets become a little bit worse in the matchup. Right. Because I think one of the things Carpet is really good at doing is powering out Uro versus these decks, like, pretty Agreed. safely. Like now the carpet is just like a dead mana source that doesn't really do anything. Like it's it produces a lot of green, sure, but this is not the best wasteland. I left in wasteland for Boseju, 
because the other person had it who played mana traders. But now that I've seen this person's list, actually when we searched with them, we saw exactly one tropical island, which is really mm -hmm. funny. So that means this wasteland's like basically awful. Yeah, I guess the the use now is just double hard casting days. Although with carpet, that's you know not even going to do anything for us. And so yeah, so I let the show resolve because like if you force. I uh, they're just gonna veil twice. Like that doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. This is what I should have done in game one and didn't, essentially. Brainstorm's a pretty good draw there. Unfortunately I use my wilt, so I can't just like wilt it, but um... So this is interesting insofar as it does let them cycle both of their veils. Um the question is then, like, how likely are we to actually win the game just by attacking three times with no other actions versus bringing something into a threat, maybe cutting a turn or two turns off the clock, but then giving them two redraws to other cards? So, counterpoint, what if I just force a little both veils? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that's actually good because now I'm so exposed to so many cards killing me on the spot. And if I just leave the veil... Like, so... Suppose, suppose Veil cantrips into Cunning Wish. I literally die. Right. And like, it, it, the problem is, if I don't counter these Veils, they just get to cycle and look at so many cards, whereas like, at least I can trade my two for ones in the opposite direction and sort of force them into one, only one draw step instead of like three draw steps, right? Yeah, okay. I like it. So... That's the reasoning. And that's also why I end up playing Tarmogoyf this turn. Because suppose they they somehow like I mean this deals four damage, I guess, is my reasoning. I don't think the forager matters. Because if I get to attack again, I win. Right? Yeah. The argument would be, let's say, uh we cast Forager and then we force the veils and then we get to pick up a force. If mm -hmm. I don't know, it could be relevant against Coatl or something if the, the top of that deck is stacked in a very specific way, but... And look at that! <laughs> we traded two forces for two veils to win the game. So not so, not the way that we expected, maybe, but it happened, and yeah. I spent out. a lot of time thinking about that. Look at my clock. It's down, like, kind of low, because I spent a lot of time thinking about that term, because it's super weird, right? I think, I think a lot of people would not force there, even though they should, and then they would get bodied by, like, them drawing Cunning English. Uh, round five, spoiler, my opponent's 4-0, no, they just concede and go do something else for an hour. And then I'm in top eight, because, you know, it's good to be very lucky to be paired up. That's all I'm going to say. say oh, Emrakul is also a reason to force, yes. They only play one Emrakul, though, but uh, obviously, like, one. Alright, Slay It with Roses. My scouting indicated they were Red Prison, and people in this event also said they were Red Prison. Basically the similar version. So, what happens in this matchup is you're not really allowed to keep hands that don't have counter magic. I mean, the sand has counter magic, it has a basic island, but it's like... It's not very exciting, is it? it it's not. I, are you... Is it on the play? Hmm... Yeah, we, we kind of need specific lands and also threats for this hand to kind of come together. It's... Ugh. It's yeah, really I awkward. I, I think you reluctantly keep, but it's like on the low end for this matchup, for sure. Days is really, really, really strong in the matchup is the counterpoint. And like this is almost perfect, to be quite fair. Yeah, so how do we want to stack these then? Because... We definitely want the land available next turn. We're not going to be able to cast the Forager, but we want access to it. Mm -hmm. And if we have to force something, I, maybe we end up pitching Uro? I think I'm going to pitch Uro, because thing? I know they're yeah. Red Prison. This is super hard to cast versus them all the time, and it's like not even that good a lot of the time. So I, I agree. I'm probably pitching this. I don't want to pitch these other two cards. I think they're too important. Okay. I think I end up putting Tarn in my hand and I shouldn't have. I should have at least like put a blue card in my hand to have the option of pitching it, you know.
So this is annoying. I think you have to daze this one. Yeah. They've already used one spirit guide, so it's not likely you'll get spirit guided again. I, I like playing it kind of slow here. Like trade your yeah. cards for their cards. Um, you know, if they have a spirit guide, that's also going to be relevant on a future turn in all likelihood. Um, yeah. And I think the force is, you know, a premium interactive card that you need to be able to to save. So this one, there's actually a chance I'm supposed to fawn it and just untap and play my forager. I don't hate that, actually. I don't think I do, but I think this is a huge mistake in retrospect. I, I, I think you're meant to, because you know, yeah. especially if this is the Basuta list that doesn't have, like, Chandra or something to maybe punish you. No, th it, this is this person plays Chandra's. Oh, always. this is Planeswalkers. Okay, but, well, it, that, it, the thing is with that is, if you have a days left over, yeah. how likely is it that they have, you know, Soul Land plus another mana source, yeah. has to be Mox or Spirit Guide plus a Chandra, yeah, I, I kind of like Force and then play Forger. I think that's a, a good line. Yeah. I think I daze, but I I, I, re I I regret this a lot in retrospect. Because the problem is now... So if if your plan is to Force, are you brainstorming first? I think you have to. Although like you're likely going to pitch that anyways, but I just think the information is too valuable. This is not great. Now I know, like, all right, I probably have to force this because this costs three under Trinosphere anyways, and then I'll never have protection anyways. So I think I'm just meant to force it pitching the Uro. Yeah. Just putting, like, two lands back and redrawing one of them. So now the problem is I can play the Forager, but now if they have Chandra as a follow-up, I actually die on the spot, I think. Like... I mean, yeah, I get to chain lightning the Chandra, but that's such a bad exchange, right? Does Delve go through Sphere? Oh, but the problem is if I don't fawn the Sphere, then I can't fawn the Chandra anyways, right? Right. It's either way, the uh, line we took. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that That's not actually the issue. But now I'm exposed to Chandra, and guess what? I'm yeah, about to be sad. Well, the first time they imprinted one Chandra, I'm like, oh god, I'm <laughs> definitely getting chandra And this is why you play Chandra Torch of Defiance, folks. It's a really good card. Yeah, Firefly Squad would be embarrassing in that <laughs> position, as it is in many positions, in fact. Um, so at least now I can Uro into my fetch and play the Chain Lightning. Something. I mean, I still think I'm going to lose, obviously, but... They only have one card, so maybe they just don't have anything good behind because they've played Chalice, Chalice, Chandra, imprinted another Chandra. But if they have something good, I'm probably dead. And uh, that qualifies as good enough for me, generally. They got Tormod script because they're afraid of getting Uroed, which makes sense, you know? If you, uh, I guess if you ponder into a bolt here, you're still in decent shape. That's why I do that. But, yeah. I think you just have to shuffle that. It's just way too bad on average. Agreed. And now we just play my stuff and probably lose to their Insaring Bridge that we know that they play a lot of. And look at how good this card looks here. <laughs> just Mole Drifter. We're just Mole Drifting. Do you love a good Mole Drifter? Oh, I was not it. supposed to flip this Delver. That was actually a huge mistake. It will never get to attack. You might as well just oh, leave it as a one more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so bad. Yeah, if I had fallen the uh, second Chalice, I think I would have been in much better shape. But I'm not sure I would have won, but I would have been in better shape. Yeah, I mean, you can't actually win from this position, right? I don't think so. Yeah, let's get to the next game then. Oh, uh, let me just make sure real quick. I think... Okay, now we're done. I, I think the Magus actually makes it a hard lock. Although, I don't play Brazen Borrower, so I think I actually am hard-locked. Yeah, maybe you were meant to play it out for a few turns just to not demonstrate that. Um, you don't want to show them that you have no copies of Borrower in the deck, but... So, how do I sideboard? Pyro comes out. These are not great. 
I didn't side in Rough Tumble because I know they play more Planeswalkers. I think if there was a Basuda version, I would have Rough Tumble in my deck. And mm -hmm. uh, the other cards are not great. So, you know, is what it is. Oh, it was five lands and two counters. I don't think you can keep. Even though you do pass the force check, the problem is if you have no cantrips or no follow-up, you actually lose on average. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, I think this hand's a pretty clear keep. <sighs> there are a few questions. First off, do you play Delver on one? Second off, do you bottom... You probably just bottom a land and just keep the bull. Yeah, bottom yeah. bog. Uh, the, I don't think that's a question. The, the real question is, do you play Delver on turn one? I don't mm. think I did. Don't think so. Yeah. I think just too much can go wrong. So I ended up not forcing the Chalice because I think maybe I can ride this Tarmogoyf to victory by killing them with it. Maybe that's a mistake in retrospect. I mean, the fact that their land is Ancient Tomb maybe makes that a little more realistic. Yeah. Um, yeah. That That's being what... said, uh, I don't know. It's... The thing is, you're, you're playing Tarmogoyf here anyway, so if their follow-up is something like Blood Moon, that's all going to get you. Um, and so now you have to force this. Well, the reason not to force the Chalice is... I mean, the problem is we don't have another blue card, and there's like plenty of blood moons and shit that kill you as well. I always daze is a reasonable draw. I don't know, may maybe that was a mistake. Do I get to daze something here? I don't. Really sad. This is like the perfect card for Storm Wave 2. Yeah, I, I mean. For as mindless as this mono red deck can look sometimes, I think it actually just is a very good deck, especially if you cut the, you know, Firefox squad and stuff for actual and good play cards. like this and Chandra and Karn, the great creator. Like, I think this card is super good in this deck because this deck normally doesn't have card selection, you know? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I should have just played the Delver out and not... It's like Legacy Karnza? Is that a thing? Is that Ponza with Karn? I guess so, yeah. And that deck actually is pretty strong in, in modern as well. Is it? I'll be, I'll be playing more modern soon. I promise, Dom. Well, the thing is, it falls into that category of decks that can't beat prowess to save their life, but are actually decent against each other. Uh, well, I guess I have to fawn this, otherwise I do not participate in the game for a little bit. Right. I guess you could make a case for not fawning it, and... Yeah, I... Oh, I I guess I don't, but now they have a second one of these, I'm like, God, this yeah. is miserable. Now I'm just literally dead, I think. And the other thing is, E is my out to Chalice, but you know what makes it not an out? I can't oh God, EE yeah. for zero. <laughs> like, literally, Wilt is my out now. It's just so bad. At least land is a decent draw there, because maybe I can, like, do the thing, but it's just so unlikely now. And I'm like, all right, I guess I have to fawn this. But this is kind of miserable. Probably going to lose. And these season Power Masters look amazingly good here, that, right? Let's, uh, let's skip through, I think. Well, this is the last match. Oh, this is a top eight match? Yeah. Oh, it's well, only that's... five. No, because it's twenty six people. There's only five rounds of Swiss. Oh, that that's tragic. Yeah, I know. This is the tragedy. But yeah, we'll, with we'll that get... in mind, the the game one looks. Yeah, that's tough. And th this game is like miserable. I think their deck is just really better constructed than a lot of other red prison decks. To be quite fair. Yeah, yeah. Th this game I think was not winnable. However, you slice it, but game one certainly was. Yeah, I think the Forager thing ended up costing me so much. And now I just concede because I'm like... What I actually wanted to do at this point was literally just leave the computer and go literally do anything else. Yeah, Have you ever been yeah. in that mindset? Oh, several times, yeah. Um, wait, wait, are you a concede ASAP type of type of person? Oh, yeah, I, I 
when o- I started O2 in the standard one of these and just was out of the building. Didn't want to, uh, you know. Oh, you didn't even want to play or, for the prize or whatever, you know. Or when um, like I was in the top four of the PGQ against Simon and, you know, punted game one and just, I was, you know, had, had to go for a walk to clear my head after that. So, yeah, I mean, we've all been there for sure. Yeah, I do not believe I played that tournament very well, but I think I built my deck very well, which is the funny part of it. Hmm. It, it's kind of the reverse you know i think a lot of people would be like yeah i played i i played great but my deck wasn't great i'm like well that's not that's just like almost as bad you know in a lot of ways i actually spent a lot of time just looking at all of the deck lists that people were bringing and just like agonizing over the spots like for a long time we spent we stefan and i spent like 20 minutes talking about sylvan library versus second quote with this we finally decided that second quote this was probably better but when you do that for every single card for a while it adds up like time wise you know for sure i think it's like if you took a rug delver deck list at random and registered it in the tournament you wouldn't it's hard to be making too big of a mistake doing that but i think once you get to this level and you're playing against other good delver pilots and people who know how to play against delver aren't giving you those free wins aren't leaving that on the table then those card choices do matter a lot. And so, you know, you, you do have to to put the work in to level up like that. Yeah, and I always like to say this. I think these small tournament events are so different from Grand Prix or like totally. open yeah. open events where you really don't know your opponents very well that it's a very different skill set. And I think, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but what I have a lot of experience with is just literally looking at other people's decks and trying to figure out what's good for them, which is, I guess, the same skill set. I, I think I personally enjoy the open tournaments a lot more. Um, right. Because the issue with the small ones is, I think that's mostly interesting when it's more of an iterated game, and the nature of these big tournaments is, because the stakes are so high, it's never iterated. It's, you know, you get your one yep. shot, and then if you don't convert, then you feel bad about it. So, um, yeah, it... You know, like, like, because, because when you, let's say you go to a GP, right, and you you take out your legacy Delver deck and you get paired against a bunch of like Hogak or Prison or whatever, then okay, that's just part of what you sign up for, right? Right. But then it feels a lot worse to kind of predict stuff, run the numbers, get that correct, and then oh, you still run into the one Hogak player or the one Prison deck anyway, you know? Like it is. It, it kind of sucks even more to get it right and then not get rewarded for getting it right. Well, I got it right, but I actually did accidentally leave out the second red person player on my spreadsheet, so oh, that's a little bit on. So like, maybe if I have one more slot, it's a little bit better for me, but I mean, it's still... I think that matchup is even, but volatile is how I would still put it. So my hands were definitely on the wrong side of volatility, I would say. It's looking look at those games, right? Like game one is pre cyborg yeah. and you know, we, we could and, have won that with a different line. And then game yeah. two was I I got ran out of the building. Would have been, yeah, yeah we, we we no way we were winning that game, so Yeah. So I could have played better in game one and game two, like I would have had to have an extraordinarily good draw to win game two, I think, and I didn't. So Yeah, I would say that mistake in game one is the kind of thing that like you look back on and you wonder what if leaving the second prison player off the spreadsheet and then that messes with your calculations in a small way it's like oh that's that's whatever you know that's that's something that's pretty that bad still like i just literally forgot i had them on a different spreadsheet but not on the one i ended up using finally so that's like kind of what the fuck <laughs> uh but yeah uh preparing for these tournaments it's obviously it's still a game i still enjoyed myself and you know obviously i would have liked to win I really want to win so I can see how bad my MTGO statistics are because I, <laughs> I'm i so jealous. Tommy's gotten to look at those numbers like five times or something. Well, he, he's got to see them change over the years as well. I know, <laughs> it's so unfair. And like Reed has got to see it and like Jabberwocky's got to see it. I just want to know the numbers and like get, get to compare with other people. But uh, congrats to Patsy. Like obviously... Actually, I t- think they took advice from Elf Kid to play Elves, they, which is yes. funny. Very fitting. But people don't understand how insanely good Patchy actually is. Like, when when I was uh, in the UK, he was living there as well. And he was known as, like, one of the best players in the UK, if not one of the best uh, GP grinders in Europe. And then under COVID, he's just been, like, crushing every tournament. Like, he, in the past few weeks, 
he made the finals of back to back like high level historic tournaments with the right. Green Mind Company deck and like put that deck on the map, so to speak. Um, and now, you know, he like won a PTQ with Heliod a few weeks ago, and now he's winning this uh, <laughs> the showcase event, like just absolutely crushing it. So, gotta give him props for that. Yeah, a bunch of people said that I was their favorite to win. I'm like, I don't even think that way because these tournaments usually most of the people are pretty good it's really hard to say like yeah i might have more legacy experience but like who am i to say that i think i'm my favorite to win this tournament or whatever you're my favorite travis not to win the tournament just you're my favorite hmm i don't know how to feel about that that's like a double-edged dagger All right no we got we got a few subs we got four subs so let's see what's in the chest a, a chesty we got four chesties on the stack. And you know, oh, I have yeah. all of these chests from the tournament, so. Oh, well, drags. Yo. The book. Is this a trap in Etron? Tell me. Etron is a trap in Etron, so. I agree so... with that for sure, so. <laughs> I, I, I loathe that deck so much. It's kind of funny. Oh. When this set came out, this is like my favorite card in it. I love that Nasa. Yeah, people thought that one was going to be a banger, and you can see why, but it just never really materialized. Well, I rebounded a bunch of digs in my Jeskai token stack for like mm. a bunch of SCGs, then I took the card out of my deck. Oh, that deck was so sweet. Yeah. I miss it. it wasn't very good, but I think it was definitely sweet. Necrotic Plague has too much text and does nothing. So. Oh, this was a banger in Limited. Holy shit, was this card so one-sided in that limited format. Did, didn't Re play that card in like a bug deck at one point? Yeah. Yeah. It was worse than Grave Titan. I'll tell you that. <laughs> a lot of cards are worse than Grave Titan, Travis. Is Frost Titan better or worse than Grave Titan? I would say worse. But it stops Grave Titan from attacking you. I guess. Alright. We got one more, I believe... Oh, the Scourge of, uh... A rouge. Is the Scourge of Standard and Historic by this point? I guess so. I, and maybe coming to a Pioneer or Modern Tournament near you. Mmm... Call me skeptical about the Modern part of it. Because I've played against this style of deck several times in Modern. Their deck is not very good versus the card Lava Dart. Can we get some uh, some legacy rogues? I guess Uro being legal kind of uh, is is a problem for that. But well, the other problem is, what does legacy rogues do better than legacy Delver? Or legacy ninjas even? But... Legacy ninjas. Oh, dumb, 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 dumb. No, okay, Jarvis. What you do? Okay, you play rogues with four main deck surgical extractions, and so you can either just beat them <sighs> down. Or you mill their relevant card and just get them. You sound like a mill player right now. <laughs> how dare you? I dare. You, you know how I dare? I just said it. <laughs> Alright. Uh, well, this was fun. Obviously, like I didn't play that many matches, but I actually think these tournaments were more about building your deck and predicting what other people are going to do. And then you have so few rounds to play that, well... Hope you don't punt too much. Obviously, I did make some critical errors and got punished. And, you know, that's just how magic in life is. No one's perfect. Your tendencies, please. And... Well, I can see rogues can beat in Staring Bridge. I don't really think it can. We gonna uh, raid? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see who should we raid. I'll check for you real quick. Limited player trying out historic. What a fucking troll. <laughs> Modern red prison. Nope. Just nope. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Oh, it's spider space with the indomitable creativity. You know check. what? I like that deck recently. I think it's really interesting. But uh, yeah, let's let's give them a raid. And you know, dump. Well, one last thing before we go. We should thank you. I know you had to um, do something earlier. Why don't you plug that real quick? Uh, just while recording the, the weekly podcast for SUG about modern with Ari Lax. And this week, uh, the one and only Patrick Sullivan uh, coming on to discuss all the various ins and outs of Burn, Paris, which variant you should play, how they line up against each other, that sort of thing. 
Yep. So check that out. I know I love talking and listening to Pisoli. He's really, he has a really eloquent way of putting things, even though he doesn't play that much. And he has been around the block once in a while. It's just, if, if you want to cast Lava Spike or Lava Dart, I think he's the person to go to. You agree with that? Absolutely. All right. Now we got this fire space raid. 